Good morning. My name is Carrie. I'm an alcoholic. It's nice to see so many wonderful faces this morning. Um, Bob and I are, for the next couple hours, going to be talking about steps one through three. And um, it's been my experience and what I've been taught about how uh, the program of recovery works is that I absolutely have to understand my first step. I have to understand who I am, what my disease is, and exactly how it works in my life, because I won't be motivated to do the rest of the steps if I don't thoroughly understand who I am. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I said that I was an alcoholic, but I didn't know what being an alcoholic was. I didn't know what that meant. What does it mean to be an alcoholic? Well, it means, you know, I drink a lot and get into trouble. What I didn't understand was that that's not what made me an alcoholic. You know, I looked. That's what made other people think I was an alcoholic. Um, <laughs> but what made me an alcoholic was that I have what's called a threefold disease. It means that I have a physical allergy, I have a mental uh, obsession, and I have a spiritual malady. Last night when I talked, I talked, I talked a lot about the spiritual malady, and I didn't talk too much about drinking. Because it's been my experience, and this is the thing, is that if you're an alcoholic, you know exactly how to drink. And that when I put down the alcohol, I'm still spiritually sick. <laughs> so as much as I might, as an alcoholic, know exactly how to drink, my spiritual sickness is a progressive thing that continues throughout my life. So I didn't want to be redundant and talk about drinking so much because that's what really what we're going to talk about right now. We're going to, I'm going to talk to you about exactly how alcohol or how I was taught alcohol works in my works on me when I'm drinking and how I'm powerless over alcohol before and after I pick up a drink. When I was brought through the steps, you know, my sponsor started on page one. I started with the, you know, the blank page that says, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, how many thousands of men and women have, you know, recovered from alcoholism. You know, and then as we gone, as I went through the work with my sponsor, we went through the, each chapter, chapter by chapter, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph. I was taught to do the steps in a, a consideration sort of way. It means that when I come to a statement in the big book that talks about alcoholism, that talks about, you know, my spirituality, when it talks about, you know, any aspect of, you know, being an alcoholic, the question I'm really to ask myself is, does this apply to me? Is this my experience? Is this true for me? So as we're talking about, you know, the first step, as we're talking about the second step, third step, and then so on, I really want you to be sitting here saying, you know, is that my experience? Did I have that experience with that step? Did I have that experience with alcohol? Did I think, feel, you know, react this way? You know, do I react emotionally this way? Did I drink that way? Or when I talk to you about a promise or a result that I get from doing this work, I want you to Ask yourself, is that my current experience? You know, so that you can hear what we're saying and then ask yourself, where am I at? You know, because that's the way that I was taught, that I was to look at this book and the way that I was taught to listen to people. Because for me, and this is just for me, I have to take these truths, these things, back into my life, back into my heart, and sit with them with God. Because that's where the real answer comes. It doesn't come from me telling you what your truth is, but for you to sit and ask yourself, what is my truth? What do I know to be true about me? And what's true between me and God? Because for me, that's where my answers come from. That's how I know who I am. And that's how I know what my next step is to be. You know, so we talk about the doctor's opinion and we talk about, you know, a physical allergy. You know, my big book tells me that I have a physical allergy, that once I put alcohol in my system, the I react differently than other people. It means that, you know, my sister is not an alcoholic. My sister can have a glass of wine and she goes to sleep. You know, and she doesn't understand why it is that I will have a glass of wine and I get excited. I don't get tired. It doesn't make me sleepy. It doesn't mellow me out. It fires me up. Booze, more booze, now. It's a completely different reaction than the average person. You know, and I, you know, my, my alcoholic mind tells me that my reaction is the way that everybody else reacts to alcohol. You know, because I'm blinded by my own perceptions. And when my sponsor sat down with me and we went through the big book, she explained to me, not everybody in this world reacts to alcohol the way you do, Carrie. You have what's called an abnormal reaction. You have an allergy to alcohol. And because I have this allergy, I, I react to alcohol in the way that an alcoholic does. And that means that when I put it in my system, I want more. 
period. And if I don't have that more, I get something called irritable, restless, and discontent. Do you guys know what that means? The way that I explain this to the women I sponsor is this. I feel like I have no skin. That I'm a writhing bundle of nerves and there's nothing between you and me. You ever, you ever have a toothache, you know, have like a really nasty cavity and every time you touch it, you know, you're waiting to go to the dentist and every time you touch it with your tongue, you get that jolt of lightning through your body and it feels like the top of your head's going to blow off? That's how I feel when I can't put alcohol in my system. That's how I feel when I put alcohol in my system and then I stop. Because the whole thing is this, is as an alcoholic, I could stop, but I can't stay stopped because I'm in that perpetual state of irritable restlessness and discontent. And the only way that I can get a sense of peace, ease, and comfort is by putting alcohol in my system. So my body constantly craves alcohol. And once I start drinking, I find that I can't stop. And so I might walk into the bar and I might say to myself, well, I wasn't 21, so I really didn't walk into the bar. Let me put this clearly. When I bought a bottle of booze, you know, or I paid somebody to do it, or I went to a bar and I bribed some older guy to buy me booze, um, <laughs> I, would, I would say to myself, I'm going to have just one drink. I'm going to have one drink, that's it, you know. I'm going to have one drink, I'm going to hang out with my friends, you know, I'm going to go to a, you know, a club, or you guys call it a discotheque. Um, I'm going to go to this club, and I'm going to have one drink, and then, you know, I'm just going to have a good time, I'm going to dance, and then I'm going to go home with my friends. But see, that's not my experience. I can't do that. What I do when I go to a club or discotheque is I, I have one drink, and then I have another drink, and then I have another drink, and then I have another drink, and then I'm puking in the bathroom, and I'm passed out. And my friends have to drag me out of the, you know, the bar or wherever I am, the, the club, and I'm covered in my own vomit and urine and I'm disgusting and I wake up in the back of somebody's car the next day. That's my experience with alcohol. That's my consistent experience with alcohol. And every time I put alcohol into my system, just about, that's how I react. I mean, I'm, the, the circumstance, the place, the thing might be different, but my reaction is relatively the same. Once I start drinking, I find that I can't stop. And that I have this constant yearning for oblivion. I've heard a speaker, and I, I love the way he explains it. He says that he feels like uh, he, that he wants to get to the state where only the heart and lungs are working. And nothing else is there. I love that, because that's the state. That is my bliss. That is Carrie's heaven. I'm not present. I'm just breathing. You know, and that's, that's the state that I, uh, I tried to attain regularly in my life. And um, that's not normal. That's not the way that the average person reacts. That's not normal at all. I thought it was. You know, my big book, and I love it, um, my big book tells me, in a doctor's opinion, I'm not going to go word for word, paragraph by paragraph with you guys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the important points on, you know, step one. And, you know, the bottom line is this, is there's no substitute for good sponsorship. You know, we're going to give you some ideas. We're going to talk about some important things. We're, hopefully I can disturb you on your question of alcoholism. Hopefully you're going to hear what we say and hear what we're talking about and say to yourself, that's me. I got to have that. Or I had that. I got to have that again. Or can I go, can I go deeper? Can I go further in my spiritual experience? Can I have more of God in my life and less of me? You know, but the bottom line is this, is there is no substitute for good sponsorship. And sitting here in this room today is, we're at a pep rally right now. Our job is to inspire you about this book. And then it's your job to go out and get this experience for yourself. Because don't take my experience with the big book. And my experience is my experience, but it's no substitute for yours. Because my job and my experience and what I was taught was this. It's my job to have a spiritual experience and a spiritual awakening because there's nothing that is going to cure my alcoholism or relieve my alcoholism other than an experience with God. My experience is my experience. You guys have to have your own. So don't let me read your big book for you. Don't let me and what I talk about be your ultimate authority. What you need to do is take what I'm talking about, what Bob's talking about, and bring that back to your life. Bring that to your sponsor. Ask some questions. Be inspired. Um, so we're going to talk about it when we talk about, you know, the hopeless alcoholic. You know, throughout the big book, it talks about that. And then the question is, what is a hopeless alcoholic? What does being a hopeless alcoholic mean? Does that mean that uh, I'm consigned to die? Does that mean that I'm never going to have any hope, that I can never stop drinking? Or does that mean, apart from divine help, I can't stop drinking? My sponsor told me that based on myself, my human aid, my personal self, my will, I won't stop drinking. That with divine intervention, that my alcoholism can be arrested. 
So what that tells me is that anything or anything I do to try to control my drinking will fail miserably. I mean, have you guys ever tried this? Have you tried, you know, you know, we heard, we've all heard, you know, the ge ge geographical cure, right? You know, like I'll move somewhere else and I'll drink differently there. Or, you know, I love the boyfriend cure, which is my boyfriend sucks, so I'll get a different one. And maybe this time it'll be different because I drink because of him, because he doesn't love me enough, or he loves me too much, or he watches too much TV, or he doesn't give me the moat. Um, so if I find a better boyfriend, then my drinking will be fixed, right? If I'm 10 pounds skinnier, you know what? I won't need to drink so much anymore, because, you know, skinny women are happy. Um, or how about this? If I was just prettier, if I was just smarter, if I could finish that college degree, if I could change any one thing in my life, it would be better, wouldn't it? But that's not my experience, because my experience is no matter what I do in my life, I bring me with me, and therefore I bring alcoholism. You know, so my big book tells me that there's nothing I can humanly do to arrest my alcoholism. The only thing that I could do is look for a spiritual experience and come to this program and do what I'm told to do and show up and do exactly what my sponsor did and what her sponsor did and what her sponsor did and trust that this process will work. So for me, that's what being a hopeless alcoholic is all about. It doesn't mean that I'm helpless. It doesn't mean that I can't get better, but it means that based on myself and my will, I can't. That I need to follow the dictates of good orderly direction. My big book tells me that I have to have an, um, a spiritual experience. And the doctor's opinion, it talks about that. It says that, um, that we have to have to have an entire psychic change. What does that mean? What does an entire psychic change mean to you? Does that mean that, um, you know, I go to the mountains and I go study with uh, Tibetan Buddhists? Does it mean that um, I lock myself away in a monastery? Does it mean that uh, I learn to meditate and levitate and, you know, and what does that mean? In my experience, what I was told what that means is that everything that I think that I know about my life and you has to be rearranged. And that everything that I think that I know has to be opened up to the power of God for God to come in and kind of clean out the nooks and crannies of my spirit. You know, so, but I have to have that entire psychic change. I've had spiritual experiences my whole life. We all have. You know, we, you know, we're all spiritual beings having human experience. So you walk through your life and of course you have spiritual experiences. You look at the flowers, you look at the trees, you see a bird, you know, you hear something, you're sitting in church or somebody says something, somebody gives you a hug and you feel connected, right? And then it's gone. You know, because for me, um, we, I walked through my life and I had spiritual experiences all the time, but I didn't have an entire psychic change. You know, and it, the entire psychic change is what's necessary for me to recover from alcoholism because I'm a hopeless alcoholic. And that's my cure. That's what arrests my alcoholism. You know, I have, I have a, you know, I have that physical allergy and I can't stop drinking once I start. I have a mind that tells me that that's perfectly normal, that everybody else reacts just the way I do. I have a mind that tells me that this time it'll be different, that this time I will feel better. Somehow, somehow I will manage to rest. You know, I will be able to drink like everyone else. Or how about this? And this isn't the truth. I don't want to drink like everyone else. I don't want to have one or two glasses of wine and then go to sleep. What I want to do is drink the way I want to drink without the consequences for my drinking. You know, the big book, it talks about the boy who whistles in the dark, who, who secretly would take, you know, would take five or six drinks, and the thing is that he wants to drink without impunity. That's what I want. I don't want to drink like a non-alcoholic. I want to drink like an alcoholic, but have non-alcoholic consequences. Those are, that's the way that I want to drink, because that's the way that I react to alcohol. That's the way that I think about alcohol. Because I'm different than other people, and the idea that I will be like other people absolutely has to be smashed. The idea that I can drink, think, react, be like other people has to be smashed. I have different rules that apply to my life. And I was taught that. I was taught that I, the idea that I can live like other people, that, uh, that, their, that their rules, their moral things, the things that they have to do in order for them to be okay, that I can't do that, that I have to work even harder because I have this disease. And it's this disease that, that is only arrested by having a spiritual experience. It's only paused that I have, you know, I have, you know, I have freedom from alcohol today. I don't think of alcohol as being a solution to my problem. I don't think about, about alcohol, period. I haven't had an obsessive thought about alcohol in over 10 years. doesn't mean that I'm perfect. It means that I'm 
just finally getting to be just like everyone else who's not an alcoholic. It gets me to the starting gate. I'm not a spiritual giant. I'm a human being. And all this, all this step work, all these things, this entire spiritual experience that this big book talks to me about tells me that I absolutely need in order to recover from alcoholism only gets me to the point where I behave like everyone else. Period. So I have this, this spiritual experience. I have this entire psychic change. And I no longer think about alcohol as being a solution to my problem. I recoil from it like a hot flame. I'm safe and protected. Prior to that, you know, I either thought about alcohol as being a solution to my problem or I thought oblivion is better than this. If I could just not be present for five minutes, if I could just not be me for five minutes, if I could be unconscious, because I think in my sleep. You know, you know what I'm talking about? When you think in your sleep and you wake up more exhausted than when you went to bed, and you wake up and there's bloody finger, nail marks in your palm and your jaw hurts from clenching your teeth because even in your sleep, you're there. You know what I'm talking about? That's called spiritual malady. <laughs> you know, again, I'm not like other people. And so... What my big book, what my doctor's opinion, what my first step is all about is about learning that I'm not like other people, that I have a different experience, that I bring, you know, this sick spirit, I bring this crazy mind that tells me that alcohol is a solution to my problem, and I bring this allergy to the table, and that with those three things combined, I'm a hopeless alcoholic, and there's no hope for my recovery but for a spiritual experience, which is a beautiful thing because it's accessible to anyone. That's what this program is. It's called instant spiritual experience, instant conversion. Bingo. Do what this big book tells you to do. This is what my sponsor said. She said, Carrie, do what these steps tell you to do. Follow my direction. And if you do that, you'll never be you again. That's a beautiful thing because I didn't want to be me in the first place. You know, and, you know, I'm just, I mean, I could think about it. I went through my entire life and the one thing I didn't want to be, I wanted to be you, but I did not want to be me. And I didn't want to be having my experience with being me. You know, so my sponsor told me, she said, if you follow the dictates of this program, if you follow a few simple rules, you'll have an entire spiritual, uh, psychic change, you will have a spiritual experience, and you never have to be you again. And more than that, you don't have to be a hopeless alcoholic you, or a helpless alcoholic. You know, because the fact is, and this is my experience, is that lack of power is my dilemma. So the bottom line is this, is I have to gain access to that power. That's what being a hopeless alcoholic is all about. I don't have the power to make myself recover. I don't have the power to stop drinking. I don't have the power to get rid of that allergy. I don't have the power to get rid of my mental obsession. I don't have the power to stop being spiritually sick. But what I can do is turn to a power greater than myself and allow that power to work in my life. Very simple thing. It's not complicated. It's not calculus. All it is is following the instructions of my sponsor and opening my heart to God. And, and it's been my experience that when I do that, amazing things happen. I go from being a hopeless, helpless, disgusting, alcoholic mess to being able to help other women not drink, to being able to experience God in my daily life to feel connected to God and to, to you and feel a oneness with my environment and my creator, which is something that I didn't feel before I had this spiritual experience. Um, I love in the first step, it talks about being doomed. And I love it when I, when I sit down with the women that I sponsor and we sit at my kitchen table. You know, I like to use the doomed voice when we talk about it. He was doomed, you know, hopeless alcoholic. You know, I like to do, like, the voice effects. I think it makes it a little interesting. Um, you know, got to make it fun. Got to have fun, guys. If you're not having fun having a spiritual experience, then you're in the wrong place because this is fun. It's a little scary the first time through, but it's fun. And if I'm not having fun carrying the message, if I'm not having fun working the steps, if I'm not having fun having this experience that I'm having, then um, I'm doing it wrong. So I, you know, I sit there and I like to use my doomed voice. Because the thing is, is this, is that based on my own self, my human power, I am doomed. But with, with the power of God, with a higher power in my life, the power of the program and following this, the dictates of this process, I'm not. You know, um, there's so much in these chapters. And there's so much that to talk about and things, you know, like we talk about... You know, I hate reading this book from the podium. 
I'm putting it down because I keep pulling it out and I'm going to tell you some gems, some things, some mine in this book. And, you know, the fact is, is that I had an experience with this book and this book has come up, become a part of who I am. It's become a part of how I relate to this, to the world. And when I'm talking to you about the first step, what I'm saying to you is simply this, is that if you're an alcoholic like I am, it means that you don't have the power to get yourself better, but you can gain access to that power through this program. So if you drank like I drank, which means that once you start drinking, you find that you can't stop. You know, and I love this. I sponsor, I got sober, obviously, I got sober very young. I got sober at 18. And I remember being about five or six years sober, and there's this guy that helped me immensely uh, uh, in the program. A lot of people know him as Dave F., but other people know him as Anal Dave. Um, he, <laughs> yeah, you guys heard of him? Um, he's... Uh, he is probably one of the most thorough step workers I've ever met in my life. He's got lists and, you know, schematics for working the steps. He's amazing. Um, and I remember calling him up in a panic because I was going through the first step and I said to him, I said, uh, Dave, what if I'm not an alcoholic? I hear all these things about the hopeless alcoholic, the real alcoholic. What if I'm not? What if they kick me out of AA? I got sober at 18. I wasn't even legal to drink. And he said to me, he said, you know, he's like, Carrie, I want you to stop and I want you to ask yourself. Did you ever have craving? And I said, well, yeah. He said, I want you to tell me the story. Tell me the night, the one incident, the, the, the specific circumstance in which you experienced physical craving. And I said, okay. I was in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, not drinking, but uh, doing, you guys have marijuana maintenance, you know what that is? Okay. <laughs> so I was in AA celebrating years sober while smoking pot. Um, <laughs> um, so I had about a year of smoking pot and not drinking, thinking I was sober. Um, and I decided that I was going to drink, you know, because I, was, I had just turned 18 and I deserved it because I was going to go to college, but I had just dropped out of high school. And I needed to go to frat parties, but, you know, instead I was homeless living in the park, but I was going to drink. Um, so I said, I'm going to go out and drink one night. I'm going to have one night of drinking. I'm going to drink, I'm going to get it out of my system, and then I'm going to go back to AA. Because I thought that was in my power. Because I didn't realize what being powerless was. So I went out and I drank everything. I mean, everything that I had missed in that year, not drinking. You know, I drank and drank and drank, you know, shots of tequila. I was a mess. Right, I drank and drank and drank and drank and drank, right? I drank my entire paycheck away, you know? And when you're 18, you know, uh, 200 bucks is a lot of money. Um, so I drank and drank my paycheck away. And uh, I woke up the next day, and I had five bucks in my pocket. And I smoked at the time. And I had five bucks, and I said, you know, I can go back to AA. Nah, I have five bucks. I can buy a bottle of cheap wine, and a pack of generic cigarettes. And that's exactly what I did. I had, I had no intention of drinking the next day. I was just going out to drink for one night, and it was not within my power to stop. And I woke up the next day, and I scraped the change out of my purse and the couple bucks I had in my pocket, and I went to the liquor store, and I continued to drink. And I didn't stop for four months. And I drank every day. And so I told Dave that, and he goes, well, welcome, Carrie, you're an alcoholic. That's what being a hopeless alcoholic is all about, that I could want to stop desperately. I could want to put down the bottle. I want to put the plug in the jug, but I can't because I'm hopeless. And so for me, and this is just my experience, that if I react that way to alcohol, that makes me a hopeless alcoholic. So if you can identify with that story, and if that is your experience, that the most desperate desire to stop that once you put alcohol in your system, you can't stop, and you have a mind that tells you that you can, then that's what, if you experience that the way that I experience that, then that means that you're an alcoholic just like me, which is a beautiful thing. Because if I'm an alcoholic who knows that I'm a hopeless alcoholic, that means there's hope for me. If I'm an alcoholic who thinks that I have power over alcohol and power over alcoholism, I'm screwed. Anyway... I think I've taken enough of your time. I'm going to open it up for Bob. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Great job, Carrie. Thank you very much. Uh, if you would indulge me in a moment of silence, I'd like to open with a prayer. Lord, help me to set aside everything I think I know about you, everything I think I know about myself, everything I think I know about others, 
and everything I think I know about my own recovery, all for a new experience in you, Lord, a new experience in myself, a new experience in my fellows, and a much needed new experience in my own recovery. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be here. I really was enjoying what Sherry, what uh, Carrie was uh, sharing. On page 45 of the book, it says something that really cuts to the quick of the problem. It says lack of power. That is our dilemma. Lack of power. I, I was a victim of four delusions. And these delusions were all delusions of having power that I didn't have. And the first delusion went something like this. It went, okay, I know I'm in some trouble here from drinking, but one day it's going to get a little worse and it'll be bad enough, and then I will make up my mind to not drink anymore, and I won't. And what happened is there came a time when it got so bad I couldn't stand it anymore, and I swore to myself I'll never touch that stuff again, and I did. And I went back to it, that I didn't have the power to do what I thought I could do. This self-delusion, this psychotic, wishful thinking that I'm going to be able one day to beat this. And then the second delusion talks about in chapter 3. It says that someday, some way, somehow... I will be able to control and enjoy my drinking. That even though alcohol has turned on me and I've wrung all the fun out of it, that I'm going to be able to roll her back to the days when it was magic and have enough control, not, not to get away scot-free, but have enough control to keep the damage down to something reasonable. Right? Stay out of jail at least. You know, something... Stay out of the hospital, at least. You know, keep the damage down to something reasonable. And I couldn't do that. I, I, not from a lack of trying. And then the other delusion, it says, the delusion that we are like other people, or presently maybe, the book says, has to be smashed. I, I went to psychiatrists trying to figure out what made me an alcoholic. I, I, I was convinced that this was something I could get over and put behind me. The idea, I remember going to AA and people would talk about this disease as if it was something you were always going to have. And I remember thinking, that's, that's just very negative. <laughs> you know, I, I, you people are negative. You keep telling yourself that stuff, you're going to make it true. It's, it's negative thinking. You need to be more positive. You can beat this thing. And I went to therapy and I muddled around in my childhood. Couldn't find what made me alcoholic. So I went to a hypnotist and got regressed through hypnosis back into my childhood, thinking that maybe I was mis potty trained or something. I don't know. That something that made me weird and needed to drink. And I never found what it was because it's, it's not something that happened to me. It's something that is of me. And then the last delusion, it, I almost, it almost ruined my life in sobriety, is that I was a victim of the delusion that I could wrest happiness and satisfaction out of this world if I only managed well. If I learned the book. If I, I was mistaking the process for the power. I was mistaking the actions for the power. I was mistaking involvement in Alcoholics Anonymous for the power. But see, it doesn't say lack of a knowledge of the steps was our power. It says lack of power was our, was our dilemma. And it doesn't say lack of faith. And it doesn't say lack of religion. It says lack of power. I've had the privilege, I guess, or, or misfortune, I don't know. I've, I've sponsored a couple members of clergy. i got to tell you, they're a pain in the ass to sponsor. I mean, really. I mean, they're, it's, it's, it's easier to sponsor an alcoholism counselor than a member of clergy. I mean, they're, they're just know-it-all people, you know. And, and, it's, it, and I wa watched one of them literally drink himself to death. 
He called me a week before he died. Frank called me and he was weeping into the phone that he can't understand why he drank again after all he's done for God. He can't understand why he gets on his knees and begs God not to ever let him drink again. And he's drunk again. What's that about? But see, it's not lack of faith. It's lack of power. And there's a big difference. You can have all the faith in the world. Pray fervently. Read spiritual literature. Have the big book memorized. The Bible memorized and still die of alcoholism. That's why recovery from alcoholism, sometimes in in workshops like this, the danger is, is that we present this as if it's an academic process, and it's never an academic process. It's an experiential process. That I must internalize this. It starts... In a place that it talks about where step one is supposed to happen, it says that we learned we had to fully concede to a place most of us have lost touch with. We must fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. That's not up here. That's not up here. That's somewhere else. Somewhere that most alcoholics, myself for sure, was disconnected from. Not in in this disease of separation, uh, not only am I separate from God and I'm separate from you and don't fit with you, but I am disconnected from myself. I am not of myself. I am something other and don't know how to get, I can't get home. That's the problem. I can't get home and I'm lost. See, lack of power is my dilemma. And Alcoholics Anonymous is really about a search for power. It's a process that's designed not to find the power. I will tell you something, if you're new, you won't believe the power is already in you. It's a process designed to remove the things that obscure and block you from that power. That's the process. That's Spiritual growth is never, never seems to come from addition or acquisition. It comes from subtraction. I must uncover, discover, and discard the things inside of me that are aspects of self that are blocking me, blocking me from you. And an alcohol, we all know that feeling of anxious apartness, that separation, that feeling that sometimes overcomes us. It's a, it's a painful loneliness where it's all of you and then there's me, separate and apart from. I am blocked from God, a God I can, I can pray fervently towards and can't consciously connect with. And I am blocked from myself and lost from myself. The great uh, psychiatrist Carl Jung in in the early 1960s wrote a letter to Bill Wilson. And he said something that when I read it, it just hit me. And I knew that this was true. Carl Jung said to Bill Wilson that he always suspected as a result of working with alcoholics over the years something that he was afraid to tell Roland Hazard. And what he'd always suspected that the alcoholic's thirst for alcohol wasn't really a thirst for alcohol. It's a thirst of my being for unity, for connectedness, or as in in religious terms, a union with God. I drank because of a yearning to return to that from which I came. I drank because of a yearning to go home, a home that I could not find, because I kept looking in the wrong places, and it's really somewhere I would never look. It's in here, and I couldn't believe that. And in step two, there's on, on page 46, it, it talks about just two very simple things. If I can do very two very simple things, I, I will begin to head in the direction of this power. 
And the first thing it says, it says we found as soon as we were able to first lay aside prejudice. I've never met an alcoholic yet that hasn't had prejudices. That are about, and you know the sad part about that is that I don't know their prejudices. It never occurs to me this is a prejudice. This is just the way it is. That's not a prejudice. That's just reality. And what, what are some of the prejudices that, that block, block us from God? I'll tell you a very common one that most of us seem to have. And it's, it's an unconscious thought, but yet a motivating sense of reality is that if there is a God, He probably wouldn't help me on a day that I just did something I couldn't stand myself for. On the day you've just done something you're so ashamed of, I secretly believed with every fiber in me that at those moments, God and His grace and His power was unaccessible to me. And I'll tell you something, if you have that prejudice, you are in a lot of trouble. Because it is in those moments that you need God the most. And God never turns his back on me. What happens in those moments, I'm the one who turns away. Because of I believe, my ego tells me that I'm not good enough to receive God's grace at those times. And that's one of a lot, a, a lot of old ideas that I had to uncover and let go of. And, and it doesn't say that they're, we have to get rid of them completely. I can just lay them aside. And one of the reasons Frank and some of these guys that are members of clergy have a problem with accessing this power is that they believe that their ideas are the right kind. And they don't have to lay them aside and become childlike. Get to that point of ultimate humility where you realize you don't know anything. And that is, I think, where it all starts, is that from a point of brokenness where you know you don't know. And that's a hard thing to do. And then the second thing it says is, is express even a willingness. And it says if we can do those two things, if we can lay aside our prejudices and express a willingness, the book says we'll commence to get results, even though none of us were able to fully comprehend or understand that power which is God. This thing in me and in a lot of us that wants to understand God is just a phony seeking of power. You know, why do you want to understand God? Why do you want to read a lot of literature Why about God? Why would you want to better know God? The same reason you want to better understand your boss at work. Because if you can understand him, you're going to get a little leverage. You're going to get a little juice at work. You're going to get a little bit of manipulative power here. And I want to understand God because I, because I got some, I got some things that need addressed here. Right? I got some people that need straightening out. I got, come on God, I want God, I want God to be my personal Santa Claus that I can give a list to for Christmas and give, give me this, give me this, give me this. So I can't understand God, never can. If he was small enough for me to understand, he probably wouldn't be big enough to help me. So they're telling me that I have to express a willingness. Well, how do we express a willingness? Well, a couple ways. Now, I don't believe in God, and the old timers in AA told me that I had to physically get down on my knees every morning and turn my my consciousness towards whatever was running the universe and ask for help. And I was living in a, in a halfway house uh, down near Skid Row where just a lot of homeless alcoholics lived, and I lived there, and, and I would go in the bathroom and I'd lock the door and I'd push the throw rug up underneath the crack in the door because I'm afraid someone's going to peek under the door and see me pray. That's how, it's, that's, isn't that crazy? I would be that paranoid about praying. I would feel, I'd feel awful about doing it. I'd feel like this is stupid. Oh, this is, uh, but I'd do it. I'd do it. And I'd get down on my knees and I'd, I'd say that prayer and get up off my knees and go out the door and go to work and, and something started happening to me. 
I started to experience a bunch of coincidences in my life, and they were all in my favor. Out of nowhere, I got, I got the perfect job. It got me out of a bad situation and into a better one. I, I can't tell you how many dozens and dozens of times I would be just insane. And my emotions are just, just beating me up. And I don't know what's wrong, and I don't know what to do, and I don't even understand I just how, why I feel so bad and I can't get out of my head and I'm so screwed up. And I would ask God for help, and I would go to a meeting, and there would be some stranger in the meeting talking about what's going on with me. Exactly. In a way that it's like the lights go on, and I go, oh my God, that's it. I don't have to go in and quit my job I have to make amends to my boss. Who would have thought? I would have never thought that. I'm all set to quit my job, and I'm hearing some other guy talk about exactly how I feel, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, okay. And he had to make amends. I got to make, I got to make amends to my boss? That would have never occurred to me. Never occurred to me. And I started to see the hand of God working in my life from the moment I was willing to turn my consciousness towards Him. Not from the moment I believed, because I didn't believe. I didn't believe in God. All I believed in was my own hopelessness. I believed in my own lack of power. I believed that I was screwed. And I was, I'm in a lot of trouble here. There's a, a lot of cities in the world that still to this day have street light, street lights that are gas. And instead of, a lot of cities now are electric, but a lot of them still, if you go to, there's sections of London that still have gas street lights. And years ago, before the technology was so advanced, and before they had the computerized electric starters on those streets, they had a guy who would go up and down the streets with a long pole, and he had a key, and the key would turn the gas on, and then he would light the gas lamp. And he was called a lamplighter. And you could go to one of those cities as the lamplighter was going up and down the streets and go up to the roof of the tallest building and look out over the city. And no matter how hard you looked, you couldn't see where the lamplighter was. But you could always see where he'd been by the lights. And I could sit in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous at two and a half or three years sober and and I, I couldn't see where God was. But I'm telling you, I could see where he'd been. I could see the hand of God in my life. But more clearly, I could see the hand of God in the lives of the people that got sober after me. I got to go to the meetings and the detox and watch these men and women who were more dead than alive, that were in such an abyss that they would never climb out. And then two years later, I'm watching them get their kids back. I'm watching, watch the lights come on as they help other people. I, I watch these people that would probably de- be depressed and on medication all their life and they're taking nothing and they're free. And they're laughing. And they're useful. I watched homeless people buy houses. You can't get from there to here. And I got, I, I'll tell you, being an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous and staying in the trenches and doing hospital and institution work is like a ringside seat for the greatest show on earth. The, for the greatest show on earth. And I started to see the God, hand of God, I think, in your lives quicker than I could see it in mine. It's hard to see the hand of God in your own life because God works very slowly because he's old. I mean, he's very old. <laughs> And trying to watch God work in your life is like trying to stand in front of a mirror and watch your hair grow. It's not that it's not growing. It's just a T. you got to stand there a long time before you see any progress. And God works like that. He's very slow because he works through the fabric of the universe, the synchronistic universe that is so friendly to those willing to go with the flow and so brutal to those that try to control it. So where do we access this power? And that's really what what the book is about. That's what the steps are about. It's, It's a process that's been proven experientially over time. 
that, that something, we don't know what you're going to believe in, and we don't even care. All we know is one thing that we can promise you, because it's come true for over four million of us. We can promise you that you will have a spiritual awakening as the single only result of these steps. Something inside you that you don't even know is there is going to come awake and alive. And something's going to happen to you. And it's going to be good. And you're going to get the only real life you've ever had. But it only comes through clearing away these things. And on page 55, it, it it's a, is a prophecy of exactly where, exactly when, exactly how you will find this power, how you access this power. And I just want to read this paragraph and a half. It's, it talks about... Deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. Deep down in me. I found that hard to believe. I used to hear Chuck Chamberlain talk about the God within. I would hear some of these very spiritual members of AA talking about listening to the still small voice of God within them. And I would go home and go within me to try to find this voice. And I don't find that voice. I run into a pack of crazy people just in here, just going, you know, just, I couldn't even try to meditate in early sobriety. If I just sat quietly in a room, the voices would start. Because when it gets quiet out here, it gets really noisy in here. And I would just start, okay, I'm going to meditate. And what's he mean by that? And who the hell do you think is that? But, but I, after, after about five minutes, I can, I'm convinced I'm possessed. <laughs> Right? Because it's I get so nuts in here. Well, of course I did. I have not worked. I've not done the steps. I have not cleared away. In the next line, it says, the reason I can't access God inside of me is because it's obscured, which means it's blocked. And it says it's blocked by three things. And these are the three things that the, the fourth step is designed to uncover, discover, and discard. The first thing it says is calamity. I know about calamity. I'm a producer of calamity. I'm the guy who likes to live right out on the edge. I don't like to go into the abyss, but I like to always be able to see it. I like right out there on the edge. I'm the kind of guy, if I go to an amusement park and there's a roller coaster and a merry-go-round, you'll never see me on the merry-go-round, but I'm on that roller coaster because I, I like the edge. I like the anxiety that I like the which I mistake for excitement. And I've always been that way. I like the juice. And consequently, when you live a life driven by self centered fear, you become a producer of confusion rather than harmony. A producer of calamity. If you want to hear the voice of calamity, if you'd like to know what it sounds like. Imagine that a surgeon could surgically implant a microphone into your brain and we would attach it to these speakers and on a bad day we could hear everything you thought. We would hear the voice of calamity. We would hear legion. It would be just, it would be crazy. The second thing it says is pomp. I think pomp's another word for ego that I get so puffed up on myself and me and what you think of me and my judgments and what I believe. It's me, 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 that I get so full of me that I'm like a glass of water filled to the top. There's no room for anything else. That's why, that's why spiritual growth must come from subtraction, not addition. And a lot of people miss the point. They think that they can, they can educate themselves into God, and all you are educating really is self. Your edge, it's, it comes from, that's why in the book we use the word abandonment. We ask his protection and care with complete abandon. Pomp, and then the last thing is worship of other things. I could not see that. You could have put me on a lie detector when I was new and asked me, Bob, now that you're sober, do you worship anything? And I would have said no. And it would have said I was telling the truth. 
but I worshipped a lot and didn't know it. But when God wants me from, to go from point A to point B, the universe starts rearranging itself to bring me to that next surrender. And when I was about a year and a half sober, I, I ended my first sober relationship. I want you to know something. I don't think there is a person on the planet more self-obsessed than an alcoholic ending a relationship. You could go up to a guy like that and say, look, I just came from the doctor, I have terminal cancer, two weeks to live, and he'll say, you know what else she said, man, you know, just... (laughs) And I'm like that, and I'm sitting in a meeting, I'm nuts, I'm in my head, I can't... If God was trying to talk to me through the people in the meeting, I can't hear nothing, because I'm just in here thinking about, well, uh, if I see her, I'll say this, and then she'll say that, and then I'll say this, and then she'll say that, and then I'll say this, and she'll be properly ashamed of herself and beg me to come back. Right? So if God's trying to talk to me through the meeting, it's I ain't getting it because the big show is up here, right? And... And she's a member of AA and not in that meeting, which means that some hideous force has implanted a spring in the back of my neck. And every time the door to the meeting hall opens up, I go like this. (laughs) (laughs) So, So I'm not getting a lot out of this meeting. As a matter of fact, it's, it's really making me worse. It's one of those meetings where it's everybody in the meeting seems to be like a happy couple and grateful for everything, and then there's me. So the meeting is over, and I end up going out to coffee with a guy who's visiting from California who's sober 28 years. And him and I sit in this coffee shop, and I start telling him about this relationship, and I start telling him about this relationship for 20 or 30 minutes until his eyes have glazed over... (laughs) And he, he's a very kind man, and he just sits there patiently and nods his head and listens to me. And when I was done, and I ran out of gas, he said some things that would change my world. He said to me, he said, kid, have you ever thought about the first commandment? And I said, no, I'm not into that. I'm just into AA. And he starts laughing. He says, yeah, I know. He says, you and I are a lot alike. He says, guys like us, we can't get past the thou shalt not. He said, he said, I think that if you go back to the Aramaic and you look at how the Ten Commandments were originally written, they were written as statements of spiritual cause and effect. And the first commandment is, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not put false gods before me. He said, he said, I believe that you can do anything you want. You can put anything you want between you and God. God will still love you. It will not change anything. The problem is that you've just put something between you and God. You've just blocked the light. And now you are in the shadow of that thing that you put where God's light should have been. He said, "You, when you worship other things, it doesn't mean to bow down to. Worship just means to obsessively turn your consciousness towards. He said, you want to know what you worship? He says, at the end of your day, make a pie graph of everything you've been thinking of. And the thing that owns the pie is obviously the thing you've been obsessively turning your consciousness towards. And when he said that, I could picture this pie graph with a little sliver for AA, a little sliver for work, and the rest of the pie was the relationship. And I realized why I was in the dark, why I was so depressed, why it seemed like my, something was smothering me and, su- and just sucking the light out of me because I had put something between me and the light. I blocked it. And I did that. In the book it says, we may sometimes people hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably, which means almost always, will find that sometime in the past I have made decisions based on self that later placed me in that position to be hurt. And what was the decision based on self? I secretly believed I was incomplete 
that I had to have her in order to be whole. And so my validation, my emotional security, my sex life, everything was in there and there was nothing left. So when that relationship went, it felt like someone had shot me in the gut because everything of value in me was placed in there because I had nothing of my own. And I blocked the light. Goes on the page a little further to say, We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Some, sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. Where else do they use those two words together? Search fearlessly. Step four. Fearless and searching. Moral inventory. Do you know that it is not until the fifth step promise that it says that we will start to experience the nearness of our Creator? It is not until after the fifth step that it says we will begin to have a spiritual experience. It's not after the third step, because the third step is just a decision. If you look at the history of the Oxford group and, and read about Frank Buckman, they believed that you couldn't possibly turn your will and your life over to the care of God until after you cleaned house. So, if a, a fearless in searching somewhere, we promise you that somewhere, probably after ninth, this ninth step, after you've cleared away enough of this stuff, something will happen to you. It says, he was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality, capital letters. That is a fantastic term for God. The great reality. Because that's really what we're talking about. In chapter 5, it talks about where you'll find God. It says, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him. And it says, in a place that most of us ever, none of us ever visit. Now. Now. See, even as I say that, you're not here. You're in your head thinking, what page was that on? Who can I tell that to? I'm, right? My life slips by me as I'm thinking. Right? It slips by me as I'm thinking. I'm not even present most of my life. Alcoholics Anonymous talks about an awakening. If, if you really were to awaken and pop up into this as it says, the fourth dimension of existence, I think you'd hear a loud pop as your head came out of your butt and you'd actually show up in your life. Isn't that what alcohol did? Remember four shots of whiskey and all of a sudden you could come out and play? You could listen to the music. You could talk to people. You could connect with people. You were present now. And then when whiskey stopped doing that, it's a, life is a desolate, lonely business. For people like me. We found the great reality deep down within us. And it says, in the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. After I've looked everywhere else, in the last analysis. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I looked for power everywhere else. I looked for power in the book. I looked for power in service. I looked for power in, in committees. I looked for power in sponsees. And I looked for power in what you thought of me. I looked for power in money. I looked for power in validation and security and relationships, property. I looked everywhere else. And at four plus years of sobriety, I was dying in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had thought I'd worked the steps. And I hadn't. And I'd looked everywhere else. And it says in the last analysis. And it's funny because I go to a meeting at least once a day. I was going to probably 15 meetings a week, averaging twice a day. And every meeting I go to, I hear this red in the meeting. And these are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program recovery. Boy, I think I need a relationship with her. 
These are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program recovery. I need a better job. These are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program recovery. If I had a Harley Davidson, these are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program recovery. I need a house. These are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program recovery. I need to be on the conference committee. These are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program recovery. I need more sponsees. These are the steps we took. And I, it's like... Until... The pain and desolation of untreated alcoholism sometimes will wake you up momentarily. And I went back through the steps and I found that I started to access for the first time in my life. My relationship with God went from the unconscious to the conscious. Oh, I prayed, but I, I was asleep at the wheel. There was no sense of God's presence in my life. I was too blocked. And this last analysis, I'll tell you a quick little story and then I'll shut up. When I was about three and a half years sober, right before I went, went and worked the steps out of the book, I, uh, I, had a, I was working for an employer who was trying to save me. I went through nine jobs in four years of sobriety. That, is a, that will tell you something of my spiritual condition right there. Nine jobs in four years. And it's never my fault. I can't help it. I always end up working for idiots. Uh, <laughs> this guy's trying to redeem me, and he gives me a set of tapes by a guy named Earl Nightingale. It's not AA. Motivational tapes. He wants me to listen to him. So I start listening to him. And Earl tells this story, and when I heard it, it blew my mind, and it, I've thought about it ever since. And he says, according to him, it's true. I've tried to check it out, and it's somewhat true. I've heard different, there's different versions of this story floating around. But here's the story that Earl tells. He says that there was this farmer in South Africa who had inherited this farm from his parents. And it was a nice ranch, the kind of ranch that would have provided a nice living for him and his family. But he inherited it at a time when the diamond boom was on in South Africa. And he kept hearing the stories of these guys becoming Bill Gates rich overnight. And the more he heard the stories of their richness and abundance, the more dissatisfied he became with his own life and his own ranch. Until one day, he couldn't take it anymore. He sold the ranch. He took all the money from the sale of the ranch, invested it into prospecting equipment, and went out into the bush obsessed with finding diamonds. And one account of the story says that after years he never did and he committed suicide. Another account says that he just died out there bitter, broke, and alone. And it came to pass that he sold this ranch to these brothers who were developers. And one day, they're moving some rocks around to clear some land, and they found these unusual stones that they had never, they didn't know what they were. And they took them to have some guy look at them, and they found out they were uncut diamonds. And they discovered that this ranch was the largest diamond deposit ever recorded in South Africa. And these two brothers became two of the richest men in the world overnight. And, and they're, they have to put together this company to mine, to, to mine these diamonds and then cut them and market them and polish them and send them all over the world. And they're talking one day and they said to each other, we need to name this company something. And the one brother said, hey, let's name it after that poor son of a bitch that died out in the bush that we bought the ranch from. And the other brother says, yeah, wasn't his name De Beers? And I'm listening to this story and I'm thinking, I'm that idiot. I'm looking everywhere else. And the power is right within me all along. But I have to clear away the things that block me from it. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. It's about a journey to spiritual growth through subtraction. And if you are the type of individual as I was, and still am, that refuses to be wrong about the things you know you're right about, you're going to have a hard time in sobriety. Let's take a 7 minute and 38 second break.
Thank you both. Um, I have a few announcements before you go smoke or have some coffee or something. Um, we're missing a bag, uh, a plastic bag, labeled Orkte uh, Batterier. And it's not Orkte Batterier. But if you've seen this bag, please uh, hand it over in the info stand. In the coffee shop, we now have uh, sandwiches for sale. So if you're hungry, you can go to the coffee shop and have a sandwich. And uh, we'll start again in seven minutes and 28 seconds. Okay, we're about to start again. I hope you had something to eat and you're in good shape for this afternoon. Please remember to turn off your phones again. Make them shake. And uh, I have a few practical information if somebody just came now and has not been here before. The wardrobe and the toilets are in the hallway just next to the coffee stand out there. And uh, users of both are on your own sake. Uh, we got an information stand just in sight of the door and uh, feel free to ask them anything you might. If they don't have the answer, then uh, ask God in your morning meditation. We have a, a four-hour session now until we have a, a dinner break. And we do it uh, that we have break approximately every hour so you can go out and smoke some coffee or whatever you feel like. Uh, Smoking is not allowed inside the building, and uh, please use the ashtrays outside, or you get a brush to clean up after you. So I will, uh, I will leave the word now to uh, Richard, who will read the promises. No, not the promises, the traditions in the short form. Richard Alcoholic. <coughs> the 12 traditions. <coughs> One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on AA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Tradition seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never to be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Ten, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues Hence, the AA name ought never to be drawn into public controversy. Tradition 11, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. 12, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Thank you, Richard. I'm Henrik. I'm an alcoholic. Um, we do this. At, we do. Uh, Bob will do approximately an hour. Then we'll have a break, and then Kerry will do an hour, and then we'll have a session with questions and answers. And there's a basket in the back uh, labeled questions. So if you have any questions, please write them down and put them in the basket. So uh, they will do their best to answer them. And remember, it's not a talk. 
It's a question you need to put in. So I will give the word to Bob now, and uh, he'll talk about step four. Thank you. I'm Bob Darrell, and I am alcoholic. When I was newly sober, I had a surrender experience. I was surrendered by the bottle in my own state of hopelessness and a lack of alternatives. And my experience in early sobriety is very similar to the experiences that were documented by William James in The Varieties of Religious Experience, which oddly enough was the first book Bill Wilson ever read when he got sober. He read it in Towns Hospital. And William James uh, studied, made a study of people who had had conversion, spiritual, born-again experiences. And he found that those people, those experiences had two things in common. One, that people who had those experiences, they never had them when their life was going well. You never just got a promotion, your, your marriage is wonderful, people love you and you, you decide you need God. It's never like that. It's always when you're broken and demoralized and things are bad. And then the second thing that he discovered that these experiences invariably had in common is that they were transitory experiences, which means that in time, the shine of them wears off. And the old behavior and the old personality eventually reasserts itself. And that's a very common experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. I once at a workshop, I asked for, I, just on a, on a whim, I, I asked for a show of hands of people who had been saved and then drank again after that. And I was amazed about a third of the room raised their hand. Because something wears off, and then I'm back to being me again. And that was my experience with this early surrender to my own hopeless condition of mind and body. Uh, I'd gotten enough of me kicked out of me that I was open to an infusion of grace, a, 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 an infusion of something I wasn't conscious about, but my life started to become different. But what happened to me is what happens to most of us, self started to, to inundate itself again into my life, incrementally, bit by pit, bit. I became more centered on me, more obsessed with me and my feelings and my relationships. And, uh, the surrender wore off. And by the time I was four years sober, physically, I was suffering a lot from depression, I was anxious and I worried a lot. I had a mind that would not stop and would not leave me alone. I had problems with relationships. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have a relationship. I'd been through a whole series of rejections. I, I was working at my ninth job in four years. That's not a good sign. And I'm, I'm dying of alcoholism, and I, I'm very close to either drinking again, taking some sort of medication, or blowing my brains out at four years of sobriety. And I found this passage in the 12 by 12, and when I read this, it just nailed me. And this is in step five, and it, it talks about the symptoms that are net, that if they're present, it means that you haven't really cleaned house. And here's what it says. It says, some people are unable to stay sober at all. Others will relapse periodically until they really clean house. Even AA old timers sober for years, which I thought four years I must be an AA old timer. Even AA old timers sober for years often pay dearly for skimping this step. They will tell how they tried to carry the load alone. At that point in my life, everything was very serious. Everything was very heavy. Uh, there was a lot of self-righteousness in me. 
Uh, I had all the symptoms of the self-obsessed, and, and seriousness is a very is symptomatic of the self-obsessed. Someone at an AA meeting accused me of having my sense of humor surgically removed. I mean, it was <laughs> because because self ego centered people have a, every, have an inability to laugh easily at themselves or at life, and life is hilarious. God has a tremendous sense of humor. Treme if you don't think so, look around you at what he made. He's, he's, he's hilarious. I mean, he's hilarious. You know what the, the license plate of my car is? Rule 62. Don't take yourself too damn seriously. From the 12 by 12. The next symptom it talks about, it says how they suffered from irritability. Now, it's not that I'm really irritable. I can't help it if I can see how stupid people are. It's not that I'm irritable. I just have this heightened awareness of what's wrong with everybody. And everybody just bugs the crap out of me. The next symptom, how they suffered of anxiety. I was anxious and apprehensive all the time. A feeling like the other shoe was about to drop. A, a feeling I heard it described in an A meeting of impending doom. A sense that something is about to go wrong and you don't know what it is, but you can kind of feel, you're apprehensive about it. I used to wake up, at that time in my life I would wake up afraid. And I couldn't tell you what I was afraid of. But I would just wake up and my head would be, it's like my head woke up before I did. And I would wake up and it would just start telling me about what's going to go wrong at the work today and how life's going to be terrible. And I, one of the things I learned to do in early sobriety was, uh, was to start praying immediately when I became conscious in the morning. Because I used to, what I originally wanted to do was to have a cup of coffee first and wake up before I prayed. If you wait that long, it's too late. Because by that time, you're, by that time I have a brain tumor, my job's terrible, life sucks, nobody likes me, and it's gonna be like this forever. You know, it's so, so I, I gotta, I gotta get me out of the way right away. How we suffered from remorse. When you're irritable, and people rub you the wrong way, and you're restless, you need to tell them what's wrong with them. And then I would have the remorse of, of, of telling someone off. And if you've ever told someone off, whether it's in a store or in traffic where you wave at someone and you only use one finger, you know, all that stuff, it's horrible. I always feel terrible because what happens, what remorse is, is remorse is I've just acted like the kind of person I don't like. All of a sudden, when I do that, you don't like me, I don't like me, we're all on the same page about Bob. Right? I've just acted like someone who I wouldn't like someone who acted like that. And depression is a symptom, it says. How they suffered of depression. And how unconsciously seeking relief, they would sometimes accuse even their best friends of the very character defects they themselves were trying to conceal. And that was the way I was. I was the guy who knew what was wrong with everybody. I could see all my defects of character in you, but I couldn't see them in myself. And I, I knew it was time to do some work. And I, I, by this time, it was funny because by this time I had, I had actually taken a sponsee through the fourth step in the big book and I hadn't actually done it yet, but I helped him to do it. And the, there's, the Hindus have a saying that the student doesn't learn the lesson until he becomes the teacher. And I took this guy, I sat with him in the book and we went through it and he, he was able to do a fourth step out of the book and in no time at all, he was doing better than I was, which I don't like that. That's not good. That's, I hate it when that happens. And so I knew that I needed to do this. And I never did it. And one of the hardest things for me to do was to admit to myself that I hadn't done it. My ego had been telling everybody I had done a fourth step. And in my heart, I was coming to the realization that I never really did it. 
and I didn't want to admit that. But I was being backed into a corner by my own untreated alcoholism, and I didn't have a choice. And so what, what, what I started to do is, is I, first I started on the resentment section. And in the resentment section, it asks you to do six things. Very important, six things. The first thing it says is that we list, we make a list of the people, principles, and institutions with whom we were angry. Now, sometimes guys, I just had this experience a few years ago. About six years ago, I had a guy that was 23 years sober asked me to sponsor him. And he's 23 years sober and he's never worked a step. And he, is, he thinks obsessively about putting a pistol in his mouth and blowing his brains out. And this guy is in a lot of trouble. And this guy, Jerry, comes to me and Jerry says, will you work with me? And I, he's, he's demoralized and he's depressed. And I said, if you'll do everything I tell you to do. And he said, okay. And we had just, we, I walked him all the way up through the third step prayer. And we just did the third step. And I said to Jerry, I said, Jerry, you need to now make a list of your resentments. Well, Jerry's kind of a tough guy. And Jerry's one of those guys that's full of a lot of bluster. And Jerry says, resentments. I don't got any resentments. Nobody bothers me. Well, you can, you can watch Jerry for a hundred yards away and know he's uptight about something. You know what I mean? He just looks like a guy. He acts like a guy who's got a lot of resentments. And I said, you don't have any resentments? And he said, no, no, I don't have any resentments. I just let it all go. I said, whew. Wow. <laughs> I said to him, I said, okay, Jerry, in your case... I don't want you to make a list of resentments. I, make, I want you to make a list of people you feel smugly superior to. And he gets this look on his face like, oh my God, is that going to be a long list? <laughs> See, he, didn't, he was afraid to even admit that someone could hurt him, that someone could actually get to him. And his defense mechanism was superiority. That smug superiority uh, from the people he, he, that had hurt him. So we make a list of all the people that we resent. Uh, this resentment, this resentire, resensitize, refeel, replay. All the cases we've built on all the people that are out of line. You could think in a sense that your resentment list is a res it's really a list of people that you suspect owe you an amends. A list of people who are out of line. And then it says, the next thing it says, the second thing, it's we ask ourselves why we were resentful. Column number two, the cause. And it's always something very to the point, uh, slept with my girlfriend, stole money from me, something very to the point. And then the third thing, it says, we ask ourselves, and the book uses five words. We're looking for the things that are hurt, that are threatened, that are interfered with, that are injured or affected. And I believe that the book uses those five words to talk about the third column because those five words are like circling a building. Sometimes I would have a resentment. I would ask myself, well, what was affected? I don't know. I have no idea. What was hurt? And it's like moving around the building. I don't know. What was injured? I'm not sure. And then I get what was interfered with, and all of a sudden it's like I'm on the front of the building. I can see the sign, hardware store. Oh, it was my pride. It was my ambitions, my getting my own way that was interfered with. So I'm looking at what manifestations of self, self-interest that have been hurt, threatened, affected, injured, or interfered with. Now that, in and of itself, is not the fourth step. But that is the essential part that is necessary in order to do the real work of the fourth step. And then after, after you do those first three, three things, those first three columns, the book spends a whole page telling you that you've got to be free from this stuff. You have to or it's going to kill you. It shuts you off from the sunlight of the Spirit. The insanity of alcohol will return. It talks that these things are poison. 
And then at the very bottom it says, uh, we saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how we could not wish them away any more than alcohol. And that is so painfully true. And there's a, there's a, a destructive game we play here. And what the game is, you learn in early sobriety that resentments are bad and you're not supposed to have them. So you make up your mind, I'm never going to have them again. <laughs> oh, that, that, that is the, that is what makes, that's a, that's a good, that's a good rep, recipe for suicide or homicide. So what happens is I, I just pretend I'm like Jerry. Resentments. No, I don't have any resentments. Well, that doesn't change anything. So what happens if you can't wish them away any more than alcohol? And yet, it, once again, I am in a trap I cannot spring. I must be free from these things, and yet I can't. And if you've ever tried to wish them away, or if you've ever had a deep-seated resentment, and you say to yourself, okay, I'm just going to let it go, never think about it again. Well, how do you do that? It's like flypaper. How, how do you stop thinking about something you can't stop thinking about? Right? I've tried a lot of things in therapy to get free of resentments. I've beat pillows. I've tried the gestalt chair. I've done all that stuff to no avail, and nothing changed. And here's what it says at the very, towards the bottom of the page, it talks about two different things. It says, first of all, we were prepared to look at them from an entirely different angle. Well, if, if the first three columns really is my case, if I, it's kind of like taking the position of the prosecuting attorney. I'm listing, the, I'm listing them exactly what they did that was out of line and wrong and what was hurt, threatened, affected. This is my case. So if I were to look at that from an entirely different angle, what would be an entirely different angle? Wouldn't it be to cross the courtroom and sit on the defense table and start to look at it through their eyes, through the eyes of the person that I hurt, or that hurt me, or the eyes of the person that I resent, what would this situation look like to them? And that's exactly what it asks us to do in the bottom paragraph. You know, it spends this whole page on page 66 telling us where it's going to kill us. And then it gives one solution. It says, this was our course. And it's asking me to realize something. That is to make something real inside of me that has never been real before. In other words, I must connect the dots about something in a, and see the picture differently than I've ever seen it before. And it's asking me to realize that the people or the person who had harmed me, who had wronged me, was perhaps spiritually sick. Yeah, I can see that. They're sick and they're idiots too. I mean, they really... <laughs> But that's not all it says. That's just the beginning. And then the next line is what's, what got hooked me. It says, though we did not like their symptoms and the way they disturbed us. And then it says something interesting. It says, they, them, like myself, were sick too. Like myself? Oh, no, they're not like, I'm not like them. No, 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 no. They're assholes. They're not, I'm not like that at all. But the book's asking me to realize how I possibly, on the right day, could be driven by emotions and fears that my spirit could, could easily be sick enough at times that I could do to someone else what they did to me. Can I get that? Can I, real, can I get off my high horse of judgment? Can I push my ego aside and look at this objectively? Can I wake up to the reality that there is a little bit of me in them and there's a little bit of them in me? 
Could I see and really understand that if I was raised the way they were raised, if I was afraid the way they were afraid, if I was drunk or stoned on drugs or whatever is going on inside of them when they did this, could I understand that if that was going on inside of me, that I would have probably done the same thing they did? And out of that realization also comes a secondary realization. And the realization is, and if I did that, what would be the price I would pay in here? And I started to realize that everyone that ever hurt me, that they probably, as a result of those actions, felt and reaped for themselves and about themselves the exact same feelings that I would have towards myself if I had done that to someone else. And that they, like me, covered it up with defense mechanisms and bluster. But there is no free lunch. And for the, when I started to do this with all my resentments, what happened is I started to dismantle this judgment machine that is my will. The thing, this really is the thing that's blocking me from getting close to people. It's blocking me from getting close to God. Because there is no, there, there is no connection with God where it's me and God alone. Isn't it funny how everywhere in the book, when it talks about enlarging your spiritual life or it talks about getting closer to God, it always talks about helping others. You can measure my distance from God from my distance from people. If I have a whole lot of people in my life I'm separate from and apart from, you can bet that I am very apart from God. Because there is no view of, there is no, no credible view of spirituality where it's me and God are good together but you're all assholes. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You can't do that. That's, that's the, that's the, the spiritual psychosis of guys like Jim Jones and David Koresh and, and you know, all those n- crazy people. Um, so I am starting to dismantle this separation between me and you. I'm starting to awaken, awaken to the fact that you are me. I think Einstein said it best when he said the great illusion of mankind was that there was more than one of us here. Let me tell you something. You work with enough people, you listen to enough fifth steps, you start to get it. This, it's the same person. Everyone. It's the, it's the same person. I haven't, I've listened to probably close to 200 fifth steps. I haven't, heard an, I haven't heard anything new in 27 years, 8 years. I'd like to. I mean, I would, I would love to have somebody come with something new, you know, visqueen uh, oil and a vibrating lawn rake or something interesting. But it's never that. It's always the same person. It's always the same empty, vacant, scared, insecure, driven person who's frantically trying to fill their own vacancies and gratify themselves and stepping on the toes of everyone around them in the process. It's the same guy every single time. Nothing changes. You see, I am you, and you are me. And anything else is an illusion of the ego. All separation is an illusion of the ego. The, se- the idea that God and I are separate is an illusion of the ego. The idea that you and I are separate is an illusion of the ego. See, there is no separation. Only in an ego-driven life. And that is the nature. That, that is the nature of my illness. When it says in the book that selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of our troubles, they're not kidding. It is the source of the separation. And this, this is not stuff that, that we realize and let go of easily because the ego wants to be right. It doesn't care if it kills you in the process. As long as after you're dead, everybody realizes you were right. Right? That's all it cares about. It wants you to be, want to be right. And this is really about facing the exact nature of my wrongs. How wrong I'd been about all these people. I'll tell you a, a, a little quick little story. I got a couple of them, but I'll... 
I'll use one about that's personal to me. I have another one from a guy I sponsor. But when I was in my 11th year of sobriety, I was married. I'd been married a couple years to a gal and, and uh, had a little baby daughter, Katie, who's the love of my life. I'm going to bring her to Europe this August. And she's now, she's now 19 years old. Uh, she's in college, university. Wonderful kid. And she was, I don't know that I've ever in my life loved anything or anyone like I've loved my daughter. And I'm uh, 11 years, almost 11 years sober, and my wife uh, came to me and wanted a divorce, and I didn't understand what was going on. And I had a, a guy that I sponsored named Craig, who was one of my confidants. My, my sponsor had been gone on, on vacation, like for six months, traveling around the country. And I didn't have, really have an active sponsor for a while because he'd call about once a month. I'd talk to him. And so my, my sponsor, he became my confidant through all these marriage problems. And we went to some marriage counseling and everything. My wife came to me one day and she said, I don't want to do the counseling anymore. I just want a divorce. And I, I live in a city, Las Vegas, where you can get divorced quick. I mean, you can get divorced so fast that you haven't even gotten the visa bill for the divorce yet, and you're already single two weeks. I mean, it's that quick. And, and I got a divorce on a Thursday, and the next day, Friday, I find out that my daughter and my just ex-wife moved in with Craig, my best friend. And I find out they'd been sleeping together for the whole last year of my marriage, and everybody knew about it except me. Now, here I am. I'm almost 11 years sober. You guys have been telling me for 11 years there's no such thing as a justifiable resentment. Well, I got one now. Matter of fact, I can find people, I can find old timers in A that'll agree with me. And, you know, I'll tell them all about it. They'll go, oh, Bob, and didn't you just buy her a car? And I go, yes, I did. And the, the nail holes in my hands would open up a little wider from the cross, you know. And, and you know, when you're, if you've ever been that kind of victim, and it's all of, that when you victimize yourself like that, there is a little ego gratification in the attention and the suffering. But if you're an alcoholic like I am, you start to get real sick in that state. Real sick. Scary, scary sick. And my life is on the line. And I'm, I'm, I'm close to doing something that will end my life. Maybe through ending someone else's. And it's dangerous. And I went back through this process and I knew that the answer was in this. And thank God I had, I had done four, I had done a couple four steps out of the book by this time. And when I, when I put both of their names down, and I put what they did, and I put what was hurt, threatened, affected, injured, or interfered with everything. Every aspect of self, pride was devastated, security, emotional security, material security, my pocketbook, my ambitions, my way. It was not my way. I, I was happy. I thought things should have stayed the way they were. Everything in me was hurt, threatened, affected, or interfered with. And then the book says something interesting. It says, this was our course. I had to realize how the people who had hurt me were perhaps like me. And so there's a prayer in here. And the prayer is we ask God to help us to show them, which means demonstrate towards them, act towards them. With the same tolerance, pity, and patience, I would cheerfully grant a sick friend. And I started saying that prayer and I started trying to realize what was going on inside of them. In other words, to look at it through their eyes from an entirely different angle. Now, I've looked at it through my own self-centered vision and perception. But what did it look like to them? And I'll tell you what I saw I didn't want to see. And it was very embarrassing. I saw that I had married, a, I saw that I had married a woman who was not involved in AA like I was. Her whole life was this marriage. And in no time at all, she built this whole life around this relationship and she found herself married in short order to a guy who worked 70 hours a week trying to build this business. A guy who went to a lot of AA meetings, 
who sponsored a lot of guys, who was on every committee and service position in AA. Essentially, she found herself married to a guy who wasn't there very much. And also, when I was there, I was, I was what they call, they talk about in the family afterwards, emotionally unaccessible. See, my problem is, is that I, I don't know how to do intimacy. I'm real good the first six months of a relationship until I run out of stories to tell you. And now I've run out of stories and I don't know what to talk about anymore. And I can't stand the silence. So I stay busy. And I work 70 hours a week. I get involved in AA because I don't know what else to do. Because this vacancy, this incompleteness inside me just drives on me. And I don't know how to make it any different. I hadn't learned how to, to practice these principles all in all my affairs. I didn't know how to teach. I didn't know how to, to respond and act towards a spouse like I would a guy I sponsor. I didn't even know how to do that. And so uh, I worked a lot. And I, could, I started to realize the desolation and the loneliness that my wife experienced in that marriage. And I, saw, I started to see a truth that I didn't want to see. That I was really where it counted. I was a lousy husband. I, I used to pride myself on being, I was a good provider and gave her everything she needed and, and I never cheated on her and I would pat myself on the back. But where it really counted, I wasn't there. And I didn't know how to be. So I rolled over it and stayed busy. And when I could really understand that and awaken to that reality, I had this epiphany experience and the epiphany experience was, oh my God. How did she stay in that marriage as long as she did, in that loneliness, and that desolation? And I thought to myself, my God, I would have probably had an affair too. See, I was getting my needs met in, in the workplace and in AA, but she didn't have that. And the emptiness in her life was overwhelming. And I started to realize exactly what had happened to her. And I, uh, I also realized the price that she paid would be the same price that I paid. And I realized, my God, if I'd have done that, I'd have felt awful about myself. And Karen did. She, her and I are very good friends today. When I went to make my amends to her, I said to her how, I told her how, a couple things I had to make amends. One was for talking bad about her after it happened. And it, I demeaned her relation, I her demeaned her reputation in AA. I didn't mean, didn't mean to do that, but I did it. And I had to go change that. And I had to go around AA telling the truth that it was really me. And then I said to her something she needed to hear. I told her how sorry I was that I was such an absentee husband and such a bad husband that she was driven by that loneliness of me not being there to doing something that she never would have ordinarily done. And I told her how sorry I was to be a big part of that. And how I, that if I would have known any better and if I could have been the husband I should have been, I know she would have never cheated on me. And when I told her that, she started to cry. Because all she ever wanted me to do was get it. She just wanted me to get that. Just to understand. She, she never liked herself for what she did. But you know something? In the book it says we made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. If I would have went into that marriage and I would have hired the most brilliant psychiatrists, sociologists in the country, and I would have sat them down in a room and I would have said to them, listen, I'm marrying this gal who's very loyal, very monogamous, she's a good-hearted woman, can you give me a game plan that I could implement over the next couple years that would make her cheat on me? Could you come up with something like that? I'm telling you, they couldn't have come up with a game plan any more effective than what I did. And yet, I'm asleep at the wheel. I don't even know I'm doing that. Because I'm not awake. I'm not awake to, what, to the interaction of my, my 
things I do with other people. I'm not awake to getting it, what happened, what other people's experience is. I can't see past myself. And that's the problem with people that are asleep and, and we don't understand why life is treating us this, this way is that we can't see what's really going on. I can't see past myself and my rationalizations and my justifications and the things I want to highlight to see what's really true. And then the last part, it says, referring to our list again, we put out of our minds the wrongs others had done. We resolutely looked for our own mistakes. And then a little bit later, a couple sentences down, we try to disregard the other person involved entirely. There's a thing that goes around Alcoholics Anonymous where people refer to this part of the fourth step as looking for our part. I'll tell you, I, I think that's a dangerous approach. And I'll tell you why. And I, I got this one day after a guy went out that I sponsored to make amends and it went badly on him. Because he, he was going out to clear up his part. See, if there's going to be my part... There's another part implied, their part. And naturally, of course, their part's a little bigger than mine. I mean, you know. <laughs> right? The book says, doesn't say, there does not mention looking for our part here. Matter of fact, it says the opposite. It says, putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done. We resolutely look for our own mistakes. We try to disregard the other person involved entirely. This is not about parts. This is about my mistakes. This is about where I've missed the mark. This is my inventory. There is no subconscious holding on to, to the other person did something or had a part. I'm clearing up my side of the street. And when you can do that and really look at your own behavior in its own light... It's different. See, I am a master at hiding my selfish, self-centered behavior in the shadow of anything I could find that you did wrong. I think that's one of the reasons I was so judgmental and I would just look to see what was wrong with people because then that gives me license to be selfish and dishonest and all this stuff. I was the kind of employee, if I could find some things that my boss did that weren't right, it almost was a license to steal a little bit here and there. (laughs) Or at the very least, it was a license to do a half-assed job because look at the boss, look at him. When my, I could find things wrong with my parents, so it was a license to be a lousy, selfish, self-centered son. If I could, if I was in a relationship and the person I'm with, with, I caught them cheating on me, that was like five get some free tickets. Right? Because I could use what you did wrong to justify all kinds of selfish, self-centered behavior. And this, this is the first time this stops right here. It stops right here. No more. I have to be awake to the truth. This is my behavior. Um, I'll tell you one more little resentment story. About seven, 15 or 17 years, I don't even know when, it was a long time ago. I'm taking a guy through this. And he gets about a third of the way through his resentments. And he's got the worst resentment of all. And it was towards his father. And he, he came from an alcoholic home. Bad, bad childhood. And his father was a terrible drunk. His father used to get drunk and beat him. I mean, to the point where this kid ended up in the hospital a couple times. His father would go on these rages and destroy his toys. And, 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 and then sometimes, sometimes his father wouldn't be drunk, but he'd be hung over. And it was just as bad. Because now he's irritable and he screamed and shut up and get to your room and you're stupid. And then on a couple occasions, we suspect that maybe his father got sober and maybe he went to AA for a brief period of time. Because there were a couple times his father would get sober with a little better attitude and he he would make these promises. I'm going to get you a bicycle. I'm going to take you to Disneyland. 
But the promises never came true because he would end up drinking again and the beatings would start again. And the animal, the monster would be back. And this was a resentment that owned this guy. And it owned it for decades. It had owned him. It, inter- it interfered with his ability to work and be a team player with, and hang out with other guys. It, he couldn't work for a boss. He had to have his own little businesses because he couldn't work for people. He had this authority thing going on. It affected his ability to have relationships with women. He'd always end up somehow being like his dad. Somehow. And he had went to therapy for years trying to get free from this. He did, you know, he did all this beating and shouting and screaming and hitting pillows and everything. And nothing touched it. Nothing. And we get through this and we get to this was our course. And I said to the guy, I read him a little section out of this. It expands on this principle in, in the 10th step even more. But And I read that part to him and I said, you got to realize how your father is, you are like your father. And he got crazy on me. And he started yelling at me. He said, I'm not like my father. My father was a monster. My father, he started, I thought he was going to hit me. I just, whoa, I backed off. I figured this guy is not prepared to look at this from an entirely different angle. And I just backed off. I didn't know what else to do. The rage, the rage, the rage that was coming out of him was very disconcerting, very threatening to me. It was scary. So uh, he's looking at me. I said, just, just go on. And he starts reading this next resentment. And while he's reading it, I can't hear him because something is going on inside of me. And it is not of me, but through me. My friend Bob from Minneapolis says, I'm never, I am never the well, but sometimes I get to be the pipe. And what happened next, I, I'm not smart enough to do this. I think it happened because every time I listen to a fifth step, I get quiet and ask God to help me to be useful. And something started happening inside of me. And I stopped him. And I said... I said, I want to go back to another resentment. And he said, oh, you want to talk more about my father? I said, no, 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 not your father. I want to go back to the beginning. That relationship, that that woman that you were resentful for, that you lived with for a while, where you had the kids there and everything, he said, what of it? I said, it just, I was just wondering, in that relationship, if there was ever a time when you were drunk or stoned on drugs or hung over, where you might have ever done anything to hurt those kids. And he put his head down, and I don't know what's going on with him, and he, and he, he raises his head up, and he's got tears on his face. And I, I remember the voice in this choked whisper, like it, as if it came from some abyss within him. He said, I'm just like my goddamn father. I said, how did you feel about yourself when you hurt those kids? He said, I couldn't stay drunk enough. I said, do you think your dad's any different? And he got a faraway look and he said, he said, you know, I haven't seen my father in a couple years. But my sister sees him occasionally and he lives in this little beat up trailer. He's all alone. He has been forced to stop drinking because of liver and pancreas damage. His body will not metabolize alcohol. He's been forced into abstinence, and he's the most miserable, lonely, depressed, neurotic person. My sister said he's just hard to be around. He's so negative. He's so, he's so full of himself and fear and negativity. I said, do you think that you could be like that? And he said, maybe without God's grace and Alcoholics Anonymous, that would be a vision of my future. And for the first time in his life, he was able to see his father differently than he was ever able to see his father before. See, he could see himself now in his father. And it's a part of us that we don't like. So we don't like seeing it in others. I don't like it in you because I don't like it in me. And isn't it, isn't it funny how there's nothing in Alcoholics Anonymous that shows us how to forgive ourselves directly? What happens is that I learn to understand and accept and forgive the me that is in you. And then consequently it sneaks up and all of a sudden I realize not only have I taken you off the hook, I've taken me off the hook too. 
I learn to, I can't love or forgive myself directly, but I can learn to love and forgive you. And what happens consequently, cause and effect, I end up loving and forgiving myself. As it says in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. As implies a connected process. If you, want to, if you want to take yourself off the hook and stop beating yourself up, and you want to stop being depressed, take other people off the hook. See what happens. I can't change the way I feel about myself directly, but I can change the way I feel about you, and consequently, it sneaks up on me. See, the problem is, when I unleash the dogs of judgment, they don't stop at biting you. They always come back and bite the master. See, I can't, I can't have that attitude with you without having that attitude with me. Because we are connected. In the realm of the spirit, there is no separation. So in this, guys like me start to get free of this stuff. And for the first time in my life, I take the responsibility. And my friend had to look at what kind of a son he was. Not in the light of all the terrible things he da his dad did, but on its own, just on your own. What kind of a son were you? You know what he said? He says, I was a lousy son. I used everything my dad did that was sick to justify hurting him, never paying him back the money because he's an asshole. He said, I, I justified a terrible, terrible years of my life with all the sickness that drove him. And he went to make amends to his father. And he called me from right outside the trailer park. He was scared to death. I said, what are you afraid of? He said, the monster. He never could, he, he was afraid the monster was still there. And we talked a little bit and he got, he got enough courage and centered enough in God to go and knock on that door. And the monster didn't open the door. A little old man opened the door. A little old man who was neurotic and depressed and alone and was suffering from untreated alcoholism. And he looked in his father's eyes and he saw himself. And, he, and, and in that moment he said, I started to feel like I really loved this guy. And he took care of his dad until his dad died. And he'll tell you to this day that the, the greatest thing Alcoholics Anonymous ever gave him next to his sobriety is that he got his daddy back. You see, all the things he hated in his father, he hated in himself. There is no difference. And I'm going to talk a little bit briefly on fears, and then uh, we'll take a quick, about five minutes, and then we'll take a quick break, and we'll come back, and, and uh, Carrie will finish up the fourth step and go into five and six. Fear is a big deal. I think it's the motivating factor behind everything that we do. And it says in our book, we're driven by a hundred forms of it. We really are. And yet, I don't know it. I, I was sitting in it. I had finished my resentment list, and I'm sitting at the kitchen table with a tablet, and I wrote fears across the top of the page, and I'm stuck. I, I'm four years sober. I can't think of anything I'm afraid of. And I thought to myself, well, I pray every day. Maybe, maybe AA works. Maybe I don't have any fears. I don't know. And I, I went to a meeting and there was a speaker there from out of town and he was sharing. I went up to this guy after the meeting. He's, he's an old timer. And I told him, I said, I'm, I'm doing a four step and I, I got to my fear inventory and I don't think there's anything I'm afraid of. And he started laughing. He says, really? I said, yeah, I can't come up with anything. He says, well, would you mind if I ask you some questions? I said, no, go ahead. He said, okay, are you afraid of large, angry, barking dogs? Well, yeah, but everybody's afraid of them. He says, we're not talking about everybody. We're talking about you. Are you afraid of large, angry, bark? Well, yeah. Are you afraid of rattlesnakes? Well, but everybody's, we're not talking about everybody. We're talking about you. Yes, I am. He said, are you afraid of what people think of you? <sighs> yeah. Are you afraid of being alone? Yeah. Are you afraid of being with people? Yeah. Are you afraid of getting sick and not being able to take care of yourself? Yeah. Are you afraid that no one will ever really love you? 
Yeah. Are you afraid of are you afraid of rejection? Yeah. Are you afraid of success and what people will expect of you? Yeah. Are you afraid of failure? Yeah. Are you afraid of stuff from your past catching up with you? Yeah. Are you afraid of some of your debtors finding you? Yeah. He went on and on. He finally said, so, is there anything you're not afraid of? <laughs> I thought, I'm like spinning. I thought, how did he do that? Because <laughs> I was convinced I didn't have any fears. And what it says in the book is really true. It says, it says it's an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. And I'm looking for fears like a fish looking for water. It is an of me. It is the driving force in my life. I, I was in a meeting one time and Chuck Chamberlain just looked out over the audience and he, he just would look at everybody and he'd say, what controls you? And then he'd look around the room again and he'd say, what controls you? And I sat there and got chills because I didn't, I didn't know what was controlling me, but something was. Because I was out of control. And my emotions were so erratic, they owned me. And I didn't know that it was fear. It was self-centered fear. So the book says, what do we do? We list our fears and we ask ourselves why we had them. It kind of answers the question in a vague way. It says, wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? And that's true. That's true in every single case. But I asked the guys I sponsored to be a little more specific. Because sometimes it's, it's, we, we, in, in, we overanalyze the obvious and miss the point. Like in, in the United States, a common fear is people are afraid of the IRS. And they don't know why. Well, it's usually because they're not paying their taxes. I mean, it's, it doesn't, and yet the alcoholic wants to, it must be something from my childhood. No, you're not paying your taxes. I had a guy one time come up to me at a halfway house and he says to me, he says, I'm doing my fear inventory and I, I got some fears. I don't understand why I have them. I said, well, let's talk about it. And he reaches in his pocket, he pulls out a cigarette, he puts it in his mouth, he lights it, takes the hit off of it, and he says, well, one of the fears is I'm afraid of, of getting cancer, and I don't understand why. <laughs> and I'm doing like you I'm laughing at him. And he's saying, I don't understand why, and I'm going to... <laughs> but he doesn't connect the dots. He's asleep. He wants it to be some... You know, maybe, maybe he was abused as a child or something, right? Because the alcoholic, we're always looking to, to eat, have our cake and eat it too, right? I'm the guy, I know I, have a, I know I have alcoholism, but isn't there some way that I can drink and not have hangovers? I mean, you know, I want, I want, to, get the, I want to get the good stuff and do away with the bad. And there is nothing. It's all cause and effect. And later on today, we'll talk a little bit about amends, which is really the actualization of this whole cleaning house. You can change your attitude about someone, but it doesn't stay until you mend the separation. And that's where the big changes happen. Um, we'll take a break. Let's take a seven minute and 33 second break. We'll come back and carry you. I just want to give the word to Carrie now, so. Hi, I'm Carrie, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'd like to take a moment to just get quiet and have a moment of silence. I think it uh, works out well before we start. Okay, four, five, six, and seven. Let's see what I can do. I will try to talk as slowly as possible, but like a typical alcoholic, I try to cram a whole lot of information very quickly into a short period of time. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, be as concise and as accurate 
and as slow as, uh, as I can. Um, you know what it's funny is that when, when, I, like, when I talk about, you know, 4, 5, 6, and 7, I love, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about the resentment inventories and we talk a little bit about the fears, but a lot of times I'll go to a big book meeting or, you know, whatever, and we often gloss over the sex inventory. And I love to make people uncomfortable and talk about it because nobody likes to talk about it in AA. You know, the big book says we all have sex problems, but then, like, we don't talk about them. Except for Arna, he had none, none. Iceland's fine. Um, but, you know, the thing is, is this, is that Alcoholic or not, we're all human. We all have human feelings, human failings. We all do dumb things sometimes, myself included. And a lot of times for some reason, especially with alcoholics, we, we often gloss over this one aspect. It's the one area that I tell you what, I have a hard time truly letting God into. Truly surrendering. You know, I surrender in a lot of areas in my life. You know, I'll surrender my alcoholism. I'll surrender when I'm afraid. I'll surrender when, you know, I'm in financial insecurity. I'll surrender when someone doesn't like me. Um, but in this one area, it's, it, was a, it took me a long time and it took a lot of truth in order for me to truly let God into my sex relationships. You know, um, and most of it was motivated by fear. You know, I, I spoke about it a little bit last night, and I touch on it. And the reason why I don't like to talk about it too much, not because it makes me uncomfortable, but because it, sometimes it makes other people uncomfortable. I grew up in a, you know, in an, a very chaotic, violent, alcoholic household. And a lot of terrible things happened to me in my life. Some pretty bad stuff, you know. Took some beatings, you know. I... I've been molested and raped, and when you're an alcoholic and you're a woman and you're young, terrible things happen to you when you're unconscious. <laughs> it's one of those things. Um, and it's the experience of a lot of women in Alcoholics Anonymous that we come in here and we've been damaged in this area tremendously. Um, it's this one area that we're incredibly vulnerable because of the type of disease that we have. And this was my experience, so I came to Alcoholics Anonymous extraordinarily broken. Broken, you know, you know, from alcoholism and broken from the experiences at, and the consequences of my alcoholism. Plus, you know, just some stuff that happened in my life. You know, and when I talk about my inventories and when I talk about my fist step, there is an incredible amount of healing that happened in that process. You know, an incredible amount of healing that happened. Um, you know, Bob did a really good job talking about the resentment inventory. And as far as that goes, I, all I have to say is ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, when I think about fear, and what I like to do is when I like to talk about the fourth step, I like to talk about it in fit, fourth, fifth step kind of back and forth. Because I tell you what, writing inventory was great, but it didn't actualize until I fifth stepped it. It was one thing writing it down and admitting it to myself. It's a whole other thing reading that aloud, admitting it to myself and, and my sponsor and my higher power, which we invited into the room when I read my fist up. I'm one of these people, and I'm not going to argue with you as to whether how many inventories you should write or anything like that. So please, um, I'm one of these people who writes an inventory, about an inventory a year. Doesn't mean I go back to, like, you know, the girl who pulled my hair in first grade. But it means that I sit back once a year and I say, how am I doing? Do I have any resentments? What are, what are fears that just, just don't seem to go away? You know, that's the wonderful thing about writing out, and we'll talk about this later, nightly review. See, I write out a nightly review, so I have a record of how screwed up I truly can be. And so then I go back through those records and I say, how many times was I resentful at my husband in the past year? Oh, quite a bit. Maybe I should write some real inventory. Um, you know, on top of the usual inventory, like when I call up my sponsor and she says, hey, Carrie, uh, why don't you write some inventory on that? <laughs> so I'm one of these people I do visit the fourth and fifth step at least once a year. And, of course, fourth and fifth, six, seven, eight, and nine, because you really can't do them without the rest. Um, so I, I'm somebody who believes or submits to the process on a regular basis because I really do believe that I get real jammed up and I don't know it. And sometimes I need to sit down with God and someone else in order to see the truth about this situation. You know, so what I didn't know or what I found out in writing inventory and have, doing a fist step and, 
you know, especially when it came to fear, is I didn't realize, you know, I knew that I was fearful. I'm terrified all the time. You know, the only time I'm not terrified is either, uh, you know, is when I can actually get out of my own way and get connected with a higher power. If I'm not, like, connected with God, I'm connected with fear. Like, I have two, you know, two little valves that I hook up to. I either hook up to God or fear. And if I hook up to God, I do all right, and I behave well, and, you know, and, and I go through my life, and I sit down at the end of the day, and I think to myself, how's my review doing? Oh, you know what? I don't have anything on it. How beautiful is that? And when I hook up to fear, you know, I pull my hair out and I call my sponsor crying, screaming and everything else and nobody likes me. Um, you know, and any given day I can hook up to either one of those and I can switch that at any given point, you know. It depends on really whether or not I'm going to stay close to God and perform his, you know, his work well. So I didn't, I knew that fear drove me. I, I dri- drove me, listen to me. I knew that I was driven by fear. I absolutely knew it. The question was, was I didn't realize that my fear was delusional. See, I thought my fears were true. I thought that what I thought about myself and the world and everything else was accurate. I didn't realize that I had a mind that was completely insane, that took circumstances, instance, things that were, you know, just episodic and turned them into an absolute concrete fact and that it will happen every time. So, I'll give a perfect example. I was like one of those kids that was like really awkward in school and got teased a lot. Like, people used to pull my hair and call me names, and I was like one of those kids, like, I was the geek. I was the geek in school. And so, um, I took that fear that, okay, I'm, no one's gonna like me. I have to make people like me. Because, you know, I'm just not good enough. And I took that fear, Because a few people didn't like me when I was five. And I created a reality based on that fear, on that belief system that people won't like me. I need to earn their like, lie, manipulate, do anything I can do in order to get them to like me because they won't like me because of me. Because they didn't like me when I was five and not much has changed. Um, (laughs) So I spent my life trying to orchestrate myself, my environment, my everything in my, my relationships based on that false idea that people won't like me if I be me. So I need to be somebody really cool. So, you know, it was like, you know, I should be somebody on TV because, you know, the TV and, you know, that, that you know, cool people on TV, movie stars, these things, you know, like they're liked and loved, respected and loved. So, you know, I'll pretend to be one of those people, you know. So I went through my life pretending like I was in a soap opera all the time. You know, exactly. I was in General Hospital, you know. You know, I was always in a soap opera, Beverly Hills 90210, you know, except for I was Shannon Doherty, so I didn't get along very well. Um, but the thing is, is that I became and acted as if I was this person because of this fear that I had because I believed a delusion. You know, so when I sat down and I wrote out my inventory, like, and especially I love it, the, the way that my sponsor had me do it and the way that I have my sponsees do it, you know, I, I, I list my fear, I list why I had it, and then I ask myself, how did self-reliance fail me? How does self-reliance fail me with fear? Well, let's take fear of not being liked. Nobody likes me. Nobody loves me. I'm going to go eat worms. You know, so let's take my fear of not being liked. So I have a fear that people don't like me. Why do I have that fear? Well, because when I was five, you know, little Joey pulled my hair and told me that I was stupid and ugly. Okay. So then how do I set the ball rolling because of my fear that nobody likes me? Or how, how does self-reliance fail me? Well, I'm trying to control how other people see me. I'm placing... What they think about me, I'm putting it more important than how I see me, or more importantly, how God sees me. Because we're all children of God. And we're all equal in God's eyes. So if I think that I'm not good enough or that people won't like me, then I'm evaluating myself not on God's slide rule, not by God's terms, but on my own, right? So... I love that. When my sponsor had me write my inventory that way, and then she had me say, well, what's a better way? So what's a better way than acting as if or trying to make people like me, going around like I'm in a soap opera and, you know, pretending to be something that I'm not? Well, the better way is maybe 
and trusting and relying on a higher power. Finding out who I am, because I tell you what, I spent so many times pretend, so many years pretending to be somebody else, I had no idea who I was. I didn't know what I liked, I didn't know what I didn't like, because I was whatever you wanted me to be. If you wanted a hippie chick and you wanted me to be all like Grateful Dead-ish, then I'd do that. If you wanted a punk chick, then I, you know, I had, you know, green spikes coming out of my hair. If you wanted a, you know, a geek, then I was a geek. And if you wanted, you know, whatever you wanted me to be, I was that in order to make you love me. So at a certain point, I had no idea who I was as a human being. I knew that I was a compilation of everybody around me. I had no thoughts or feelings except for that which I thought you wanted me to feel. And I built all of that based on one delusion, that you wouldn't like me if I was me. So when, my, when I sat down and I did, I had done a resentment, um, a fear of inventory, and I wrote this out and I sat down with my sponsor, and she was like, what's a better way, Carrie? And I said, well, I guess finding out who I am, right? What, do, what does Carrie really think if she's not afraid of what other people will think about what she thinks? How does Carrie really feel if she's not afraid about how other people feel about how she feels? You know, these were questions I had to start asking myself. They sound really silly, but if you're as spiritually sick as I am, you know, they're hard questions to ask. Do I like, you know, uh, how do I feel about something? You know, what is my opinion on global warming? I didn't know. I had an opinion based on what you thought, you know. And so, there, you know, when I did that fifth step with my sponsor and we did, we looked at my fear inventory and we talked about it, there was so much about me that I began to understand. I used to think, like, you know, when people would ask me a question, how are you, Carrie? I'd get that fear, like, well, how do you want me to be? Um, <laughs> you know, who should I be today? Who do you want? You know? And so for me, like, when I did my fear inventory and I realized how much I lived my life being somebody else and how I had to learn and start over and learn how to be me, and I didn't know how. You know? I, you know, I was so afraid of so many things, afraid of being hurt, my fear of being hurt caused me to punch you in the nose before you even came within two feet of me because you were going to hurt me and I knew it. So if I put you on fair notice that I was dangerous and not somebody to be met, reckoned with, then you would be scared of me and I wouldn't have to be scared of you. You know, it's that whole thing like, you know, you know, wild animals are more scared of you than you are of them. Well, it was sort of, you know, I'm more scared of you than you are of me, so I will, t I will terrorize you so you won't come anywhere near me. You know, that's the type of person that I was. You know, that's how I am when I'm driven by fear. You know, and I drove a lot of people away from me because of that. You know, I caused a lot of harm in my life. And I thought that, you know, part of what, the wonderful thing about doing a really good fear and a very good sex inventory and doing a very good fist step with fear and sex is really understanding that you know, in, in resentment inventory, we talked about it. And we said, you know, that I placed myself in a position to be hurt. When I look at my fear inventory, I begin to understand how, why. You know, why I placed myself in the position to be hurt. What I believed about myself, the world, my environment, you, my relationships, that placed me in the position to be hurt in the first place. And when I sat down with my sponsor and I shared all these fears, because like, I would never admit to you that I was afraid. I was a tough, tough girl. And I was, you know, I was not going to show, you know, one ounce of fear. I'd never let you see me sweat. And when I sat down with my sponsor and we talked about this and I shared this with her, you know, I began to feel so much freer. My fear began to lift then. Um, wh when I when I wrote my sex inventory, the same things that I did or that I saw in the fourth column of my resentment inventory also happened in my sex inventory, in my sex relationships, that I was, I never was emotionally available to those around me because t I was terrified. And I was so trapped in trying to protect myself from you, I could never stop for one second and just say, how are you today? and ask myself, how can I be of service to you? That's not something that I would ask in those relationships because you were there to be of service to me. And my relationships, especially in my sex relationships, was what can I get out of you? How can this benefit me? How could this make me feel better about myself? You know, I would use men to make me feel better about myself. If I had a bad day, let's go out and flirt with somebody so I could feel special. 
You know, you ever do that? You know, you put on, you go to a meeting, you put on your best dress and you go in there and it's like, well, I'm going to go in here and be really cute and flirt so I can feel better about myself. And meanwhile, I leave and I feel a thousand times worse because I totally did something that I shouldn't have done because I made, I made other people's opinions of me more important than my spiritual growth. I used other people to get a sense of self. I didn't understand that I had done the, that in those relationships. And I knew that I was, you know, I had, I had some responsibility, you know. I knew that, you know, I yelled and I was mean and sometimes I threw things and I wasn't very nice and I got that I was pretty selfish. But it wasn't until I sat down and I did a very thorough sex inventory that I began to see just how selfish I was in my relationships. Just how fearful I was and just how manipulative I was. You know, I've been married for almost wow, almost 13 years. My husband and I drank together and we got sober together. We got sober on the same day. We have been together for, obviously, our entire sobriety. You know, that's sometimes very easy and sometimes very hard. <laughs> you know, getting sober together is not easy. Um, you know, we work together as a unit. And we work together as a team because that's exactly what we are. And one of the things that has been extremely beneficial that I don't hear a lot of people talk about is something called a sex ideal. Have you guys ever heard of that? Ah, I love the sex ideal. The sex ideal is after I've written a sex inventory and I fist stepped it, I usually have my women do this after they do the fist step so we can talk through all the delusions that they have. Um, we sit down and we take into meditation and we say, God, how am I supposed to be in my sex relationships? You know, the big book tells me that I'm to take these relationships into meditation. I'm supposed to ask God what I'm supposed to be in those relationships. How often do I ask God what I'm supposed to be in those relationships? Up until this point, I never did. Because it was, well, what am I going to get out of it? Not how am I supposed to behave, how you're supposed to behave so I could be, so I could be safe. Because I went through my entire life feeling like I wasn't safe. So I had to make you behave in a certain way so that I could be okay, so that I wouldn't be mean to you. And when I sat down and I did a sex ideal, and I realized that I had to be willing to bring to the table in any relationship what I wanted to get out of it. So if I wanted you to be kind and loving, I had to be willing to bring it. If I wanted you to be unselfish, I had to be willing to be unselfish myself. If I wanted you to be honest, I had to be willing to be honest. So what I found out is what I get in a relationship is often what I give. And the other thing that I learned was that when I bring love, compassion, tolerance, honesty, when I bring these spiritual principles to a relationship, and I do it unconditionally, it doesn't matter how you react to that. I've worked with people over the years. I mean, I've sponsored hundreds of women. I'm extremely lucky. Uh, there's not a, well, it's not that I'm, I'm lucky because I live in an area where there's not a, a lot of women who do the steps the way that I do. It's not that I'm all that popular, it's just that they don't have a lot of options. Um, <laughs> you know, so what happens is I sponsor a lot of women in my area. And what I found, and I don't know if you guys go through this, you ever like stay with a sponsee for, you know, a couple years and you hang in there? And, you know, they come to you with all their drama and you hang in there with them and you help them and you listen to their inventories and you help them through their amends and they start living on a spiritual basis and then they stop calling you. And then like six months later, you hear that you're not their sponsor anymore. And they got this other sponsor who's way better than you, you know, because, you know, they're prettier, thinner, smarter, whatever, and they do the steps better than you. When the first time that happened to me, because I was still pretty spiritually sick, I was like, I got dumped. Not only did I get dumped, she upgraded. I felt like I had been dumped by a boyfriend. Because I had put in so much time and effort and love into this relationship. I didn't realize I was kind of doing it for myself. My sponsor pointed that out later. Um, <laughs> after writing inventory and doing a fist step, she was like, oh, yeah, who are you sponsoring, Carrie, and why? Um, were you doing God's work or your own? But beyond that, so the first time that happened, I felt so dumb, so rejected, so like yesterday's news and just not good enough. And I remember talking to my sponsor, and she asked me, she said, you know, 
how's that sex ideal coming? And I was like, well, you know, I did it. She was like, well, how are you applying that? And I was like, well, apparently not very good. Because the thing is, is this, is that my sex relationships are a microcosm of all my other relationships. And often in the closest relationships in my life, the same things that I do there, I usually do other places. And the things that I do in other relationships, I usually do in my sex relationships. So asking your partner, how am I doing in this relationship? Am I stepping on your toes? Where am I inconsiderate? What could I do better? It's probably the smartest thing I've ever learned to do. Because what I'm usually doing to my husband, I'm probably doing other places. And I'm probably doing it more to him because he's not going to leave. But on the other hand, <laughs> he's trapped. <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm probably doing it at other places. So when I did my, when I did my sex inventory, I did definitely get to see what I was doing in other relationships. You know, because in reality, when we talk, when we do our sex inventory, what we're really doing is a very thorough relationship inventory. I've even included people, because I call it sex and harms. So it's not just people I've uh, been romantically involved with, but also people that I've stepped on their toes without being resentful to them. You know, and I took those inventories with my resentment inventory and my fear inventory, and I fist stepped them with my sponsor. I've done all different kinds of fist steps. I'm a, definitely a connoisseur of, of step work. Like, if you got a method, I'll try it out. I mean, I drank everything and anything. You know, I, you know, if you handed me something, I put it in my body. So I kind of feel like I need to have the same kind of open mind when it comes to step work. You know, so I'm definitely like a, a, like one of those like you know. Um, I like to call it extreme step people. Like, if you got an inventory, I'll write it. If you got a fist step, like a different kind of do way of doing it, I'll do it. Like, I, you know, one of the things that I did, and it was a great experience, is I've done a multiple fist step, like where you sat down with three or four people at once, and you read your inventory to them. But I did it with a twist, which was really cool. I did it with three women who had less than a year sober, while I was eight years sober. And two of them were my sponsees. They had all finished their step work, because I'm pretty quick with my step work. Like most of the people that I sponsor finish their amends within three to six months of working with me. You know, I'm pretty quick with that. You know, I don't have a specific time frame, but, you know, I'm kind of a no, I don't fool around. Um, I don't really have time for it. But um, so like these three women, all of them had less than a year sober, but all had completed their amends. I sat down with my inventory, and I wrote it real well. You know, I was detailed. I dotted my eye, I dotted my eyes. I crossed my T's. You know, I wrote a good inventory that I could be proud of. So I sat down, and I read this inventory to them. And they tore me apart. Oh, my God. I felt, I got up from the table, and I felt like I had just taken a boot up my butt. You know, and I sat there and, you know, I'm doing my, I'm reading my resentment, I'm reading my inventories and I realize, you know, you, you can't argue with the person that you're doing a fist step with. It's not like you can say, well, no, that's not true. You know, I kind of have, I have to do a fist step and I have to listen to their feedback and listen to the, what they have to say and take it into meditation and say, well, is that true? Like, I can't defend myself. So I sat there and it's like two of my sponsees who I just kicked their butts up and down the street doing inventory and amends got to give it back to me. Can you, you know, can you imagine if you get to like give it back to your sponsor what you would do? <laughs> oh my god. And I sat there on my hands and I remember like I literally sat on my hands and I thought, don't argue. And I had to pray the whole time and say, listen. And all I wanted to say is, guys, I know you just had a spiritual experience, but when you're eight years sober, you're gonna be as screwed up as me too. You know? <laughs> and I couldn't do it. And you know what? I came home from that experience. And I, it was 3 o'clock in the morning. I did it at a diner, too. Like, I'm one of these people. Like, I, my first fist step was all sacred and quiet with candles and sage and everything. And it was a beautiful experience because my sponsor did that to make me feel comfortable. At this point, I'll do a fist step in a bathroom. I don't give a crap. It's truth, and it's got to get out one way or another. You know, so I'm definitely one of these people. Like, I don't believe in, and I will do it for my sponsees, but I don't need, I, I, at this point, Anybody can hear my inventory because the fact is, is you know who I am. All you're doing is having, hearing me admit it because you see me coming a mile away. 
You guys see my selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. All I'm doing is putting a name on it. So, you know, one of the great things of doing the inventory process and the fist step process and doing what I do is that I'm very comfortable with sharing my inventory with others. They don't have that fear of, oh, they're going to know how sick I am. You know, so we're in a diner and we're reading this inventory. We were there all night. You know, we left a really good tip and it was a good night. And I drove home. It was an hour ride home. And I'm driving home. But, of course, you know, we have that quiet hour that we take after doing a fifth step. You know, where we sit quietly. We look over the first five steps. We look over our fourth step. We look over what we did. And, you know, we take it into meditation. And we say, did I miss anything? Is there any truth there? If you if you get feed, feedback during the fifth step, you have to. I, a lot of times I take notes. And I write it down on my inventory. You know, so, like, if my sponsor said, is it possible that if the women or women or Anybody who heard my fifth step said, you know, is it possible that this is true or is it possible that you don't see it this way or possible that? I get a lot of is it possibles. I hate those words and love them at the same time. Uh, when my sponsor starts out, is it possible that I know that I have to like, oh, I'm going to get something good. I'm going to get, you know, because usually it's some truth and I don't like truth, but I need it. Um, so when I... Uh, you know, when I sat down to do this quiet hour and I looked over, you know, the notes I had made, the questions I had been asked, the things that I had taken to meditation, and I sat down quietly for an hour, looked over my inventory, I had what I would consider a white light spiritual experience. Um, you know, Bill Wilson talks about it in his, uh, in his, in his story, and I didn't necessarily feel that clean wind blowing through and through. Um, more like I had been sucker punched and like done a couple rounds with Mike Tyson and I was sitting there and I felt completely devastated, beaten and knew that I could, that at eight years sober I was as sick as I was at five minutes sober and that I needed God desperately and it had absolutely nothing to do with picking up a drink it had everything to do with of my own power, of my own will I was nothing and I knew it from the core of my being I knew it and it was such a complete surrender and such a beautiful experience that it carried me for quite a few years until I had to go back and have another one of those experiences. I go back, you know, God graces me with a good, nice uh, experience like that every couple years. I mean, it, I really do. When we talk about spiritual experience, we talk about the uh, educational variety. And one of my heroes in AA talks about it, and he says that it lets people off the hook. Because when we talk about the educational variety spiritual experience, people think that it takes like two years to get it, it's ten years to get it. You know, the educational variety of spiritual experience is a collection of the spiritual experiences that we call the promises that happen after each set of the steps. There's promises after the third step. I read them earlier. There's promises after the fifth step. There's promises after the nine step. There's ten step promises. There's eleven step promises, and there's twelve step promises. That's called an edu educational variety of spiritual experience, and all it takes is the span of steps one through twelve. You can do that in two weeks, five minutes. Well, you probably couldn't do it in five minutes, but you can do it in two weeks. You could do it in three weeks. However long it takes, that's what that means. And then we have the white light spiritual experience, where you're shaken from the core of your being, and you absolutely cannot deny the presence of God in your life. I've had both. I've been very lucky. God has graced me with many, many ways in which he has made it readily apparent that he is everywhere and a part of everything that I do. Um, so I came home from that fifth step, and I had that white light spiritual experience, and that brought me to the sixth and seventh step because I had, was inspired. I opened up my big book, and this is now it's like 4.30 in the morning. Um, and I opened up my big book, and I remember, like, I'm thinking about six and seven. I'm like, well, if, I am, if I'm powerless over my spiritual condition, if I'm powerless, I haven't had a drink in eight years. If I, if I, on my own will, cannot manifest sanity in any way, shape, or form, you know, and I'm a neurotic, psychotic, fearful mess, what the hell do I do? I did all the steps. I wrote fantastic inventories. I have great sponsors. I go to really good meetings. I mean, as far as AA goes, I'm a lucky woman. I got a great husband. At that time, I had two kids, my beautiful children. I had a wonderful life. And I am sick as a dog, mentally and spiritually. I'm a mess. And it's like, what do I do? And I remember I was... 
I looked at the big book and I went to We Agnostics and I went to the first page and uh, the first page of the chapter and it talks about it says that you know and I hate reading from the podium because I speed read and I don't want to do that to you guys because I know you guys are translating it into Danish and so I'm going to try to read slowly but not take up too much time. It says that if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life are sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how hard we tried. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. We could will these things with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Lack of power was my dilemma. I have to find a power by which I can live, and I had to be a power greater than myself. I opened up to this page and the absolute stark truth of my life and everything that I had done up until that point became very clear to me. It meant that I could follow all the rules in Alcoholics Anonymous, but if I think that following the rules is the answer, I'm going to stay as sick as I was before I started to follow those rules. I'll just look good and stay sick in my head. I'll say and do everything that looks right, and you'll think I'm really nice. And meanwhile, in my head is a sewer because I'm so trapped in self that I don't realize that behaving unselfishly while thinking selfishly is looking for a mere code of morals to overcome my alcoholism. That I'm going to a human power rather than a higher power. And isn't that what 6 and 7 is all about? That's offering myself, my mind, who I am, my spirit, and everything that there is about me to a God and saying, I don't get to decide what's good or bad about me. I don't get to decide what's removed. I don't get to decide what's what's kept. What I do is I open my heart and my mind to God and ask God to do that job. I realized that... And it hit me, and it was real to me, that I was as powerless over my character defects as I was over whether or not I picked up a drink. You know, Bob talked about it earlier when he talked about being as powerless powerless over our selfishness, power, powerless over resentment. And he went to those pages, and the sixth and seventh step became so clear to me. You ever wonder why Bill Wilson only wrote two paragraphs for six and seven? I always thought because they weren't important. I didn't realize that the entire damn book was about six and seven. And you know how you work six and seven? Eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. You know, I really thought, I was like, what's the deal about six and seven? Why is it short? It must not be a big deal. Oh, it's a big deal. But what I didn't realize was that those were, those were the steps. This is the place where in the third step, it talks about giving our will and our life over to the care of God, right? Until I write a fourth step and I do a fifth step, I really don't know what my will in my life is. Like, I know I'm screwed up. I know that I make people mad. I know that I'm an angry, fearful person. I get that. I know the gross things about me, the big shit. What I don't know is the little things, the little things that I think, the minutia of the insanity that is me. When I did a fifth step, I got to see that clearly because my sponsor would ask some very pointed questions. Can you consider that, Carrie? You're not taking, you know, resp- you're not taking all the responsibility for your part in this. Can you consider that you didn't have to be in that relationship? Can you consider that you expect too much from that person? Blah, 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 blah. You know, <laughs> ad infinitum. You know, one of the things that my sponsor did, and I started out this talk by telling you about um, having been a very broken little girl when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm a grown woman now, but when I got here, I really wasn't a woman at all. Like, I mean, I was really literally a little kid. And uh, I was a very broken little girl. And I did, you know, I wrote inventory, and my sponsor had me put on the inventory, like my father for hitting me, and obviously I was resentful, um, and certain other things. Uh, One of the things was, you know, I was date raped when I was drinking. And I, you know, I used to, I used to beat the crap out of myself with that and think like, well, my part was that I shouldn't have worn that dress or I shouldn't have been there in the first place, you know, because I wanted to believe that if I had a responsibility in that, that I could prevent that from happening again, because nobody wants that to happen to you. 
It's not pleasant to think about the fact that, you know, I could be walking down a dark alley and something horrible like that could happen to me. So if I can take responsibility for that, then I can take control over that in my mind. So I blame the hell out of myself for that because that happened to me. And I lived with an incredible amount of shame and fear because of it. And when I sat down to do my resentment inventory, I had left um, that column blank because I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to write. And my sponsor did something with me, which is incredible, and I like to share about it because I think that it helps sponsors when they have to deal with this with the women that they sponsor. My sponsor was an incredibly intelligent woman, and she had me write in that, in that column. She said, I need to write, Carrie has no responsibility in this act. You know, and you, 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 know, you hear that all the time, you know. You, you go to, you know, a psychologist, you go to shrinks, you know, and you get the pat on the head, and you said, you know, you weren't really responsible, but deep down inside, you really think you are. I really thought I was. You know, and when my sponsor had me write that out on that paper, the incredible amount of freedom that I got. She also had me list my fears regarding that, which were, you know, was a laundry list of terrors that I carried within myself, and we worked with it that way. Um, but to write out, I have no responsibility in my fourth column was incredibly freeing. You know, and it, I was responsible for the person I became because I didn't let go of that resentment, but I was not responsible for the act. And it was beautiful to me to be able to write that, to sit there and have her tell me it wasn't my fault. That it had nothing to do about the dress I wore or whether or not I drank too much or, I, or if I didn't fight enough or I didn't say no loud enough. And for me, to be able to transmit that freedom to another woman is beautiful. I've had the privilege of hearing so many fist steps. You know, and, and, and having women heal before me. I'll tell you what, it's one thing, and I told you I had, a, you know, I've had white light spiritual experiences, I've had educational variety spiritual experiences and all that other stuff. But I'll tell you what, the greatest spiritual experience in the world is sitting across your kitchen table with another woman, having her read her inventory to you, and watch God knit her back together before your eyes. You ever see that? Well, maybe not a woman, but, you know, the guys, you guys ever see that too? Where you, you, you see the, almost the hole in the fabric of their soul, and you could just see the invisible knitting needles just putting it back together, and they walk out of your house whole. You ever experience that? That is the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. Screw my own spiritual experiences. I would rather watch that happen a million times. Because that's what I carry in my pocket. Because I forget. I'm an ungrateful little brat. And I forget all the wonderful spiritual experiences I have. Because, they, you know, they weren't good enough. You know, I'm not Mahat Gandhi or whatever, you know. So, like, I'm just not perfect enough. But when, you know, or I screw them up because I'm me, you know. But when I think about all the spiritual experiences I witnessed in my sobriety in the past 12 years. And how lucky I am to be a part of that. How many fist steps, resentments, fears, problems, relationships I've watched be knit back together by a power greater than myself because I have nothing to do with it. And I get to watch that. Then I can sit and I can look at the circumstances, the things that make me uncomfortable in my own life, my own character defects, my own what I call problems. You know, I like, I like to say problems with the... Because they, they're, they're usually... My problem is me. And I think it's everything else. So the problems that I think that manifest out of me in my life, when I look at those circumstances and I, I can pull out of my pocket and say, you know what, Carrie, you were sitting at the kitchen table last week and, you know, you know, Laureen lit up with the power of God. So if that happened in your kitchen last week, is it possible that it might happen in your life today? Because those are the things, those are the witnesses, the miracles that I witness every day. The phone calls, the honesty, when my sponsees, the women I sponsor or the women that I'm friends with call me up and say, guess what I experienced? I wasn't afraid today. I went through the entire day without one fear. How beautiful is that? And I can take that experience and say, I can have that too. Because they're doing what I did. And if I do what I did and I continue to do what I'm doing and I do today what I did yesterday and I do that today, Maybe I'll feel like that too. 
So by hearing fist steps as well as giving them, we reinforce that spiritual experience. And that when I watch God knit back and remove character defects and the women that I sponsor blossom under the light of God, you know, then when I fall short and I recognize a character defect in my life, I can turn to that same higher power that worked in their life just, you know, in front of me and say, you know what, God, I, I need some knitting. What truth do I need to see? What about me is blocking me off? And I love this. We, you know, we, um, Bob talked about the set-aside prayer, and I have two versions. They had the one that he talked about, and I think you did it, was it yesterday or this morning? This morning. And I have the one that my sponsor has me do as well as that, but I do it like ten times a day. Every time, I have certain things, like when I look at my watch, when, uh, when I do certain things, like I do this prayer. And it's incredibly helpful. And it's, God, please help me to set aside everything I think I know. And please show me what blocks me off from you and my fellows. And so when I look at my watch, when I pick up my, my telephone, when I do certain things and certain times during the day, because they're repetitive, when, like when you get in your car or when you do certain things, it's a good time to check in with God and say, how am I doing? And I say this prayer and I ask God to show me what's blocking me off from you. So that I can go back to God and ask him to remove it so I can be better of service to him. So in reality, that contract that we talked about in the third step is fulfilled in 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Um, But I think I've talked long enough and I'm going to stop and I hope that, uh, I hope that you heard something that you needed. Thank you. I'm Bob, an alcoholic. We're going to kind of go back and forth in each comment. Why don't you stand up here so we can, we'll just kind of go back and forth. Uh, First question, why are Icelandic people more spiritual than Danish people? (laughs) Arner. (laughs) That's not really a question, I'm just kidding. Uh, 